All right, I think we're ready. Is everyone getting our uh, follow up emails? Everybody getting those now? All right, I think we're ready. Feedback. <laughs> all right. Did you guys practice lead pressure at all? Yeah. Is it starting to come together for you? I know it's still, it's probably still a little overwhelming, right, at first. Um, but with a little bit of practice, you should start to kind of dial in. Is anyone having any specific problems? That I can help with. It's not the hardest thing. It's probably fun. Feeling for it. Yes. Yeah, and making sure that um, the arm is straight is right. a big part of that. Um, because if that arm is bent at all, you may not pick it up. Right. But remember that everybody's is feels a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Um. So. Yeah, that can definitely be a, a tough part of it. But you also know approximately where the artery should be. So when you're, if you can't find it, if you put the stethoscope there, just make sure it's not like straight in the middle. It's a little bit more on the inside because the artery might be very pretty deep and hard to feel. All right. So over uh, between Monday and today, you had chapter four in your white book. This is on page 135. Does anyone have any questions on page one, uh, on the test on page 135? Anything that you need to explain to you? No. All right, Stephanie, how'd you do? Um, Thank you. Makaya? I got minus one. Thank you. Valentina? I got 100. Thank you. Yerlene? You didn't miss any? Okay. Okay. Mm. So today we have a lot of things to do. We have four skills that we're going to learn, supported sideline position, foot care, bedpan, and our first range of motion. We actually learned three range of motions. This will be the first one. Um, so a lot of, of content to cover today. We also are going to get the state test applications and go over those at the end of class as well, okay? So lots and lots to do today. Um, let's go ahead and start with uh, page 98. So I want to talk just a little bit before we, we move on to today. I do want to talk a little bit about the um, body systems what you read in chapter four. And chapter four is a little bit, um, I don't wanna say complex, but it's it's really kind of hard when you're reading it to figure out what is it that I need to know here? You know, what, what, what could I be tested on? What is gonna be relevant to my job as a CNA? And I don't think that it does a really good job in that aspect. So I just wanna go over this really quickly. There are nine body systems and they all are responsible for something different in the body, but they all work together to make the body work. So think of it like a car, right? So a car, you know how a car works, right? You get in, you put the key in, you turn it, you put it in drive and it goes down the road. Gas to go fast, brake to stop. So you know the different systems, right? So the brake system is different than the transmission. 
right? If you have a brake problem, that's a brake problem, not a transmission problem. But a brake problem will affect the whole car. Does that make sense? Even though it's one small part, it's going to affect the whole. That's the way this works. What's that? Oh, you can't see me. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's good. I'll just move over here. That's better. Oh, so can't see me. Oh. Sorry. Let me get my, oh, no, that's fine. I just didn't put my batteries in, so it takes me a minute. Hold on, guys. All right, so to continue on with our analogy here, um that's the way this whole system works each one of these things is a component of the whole does that kind of make sense mm -hmm. component of the whole so Ah, there we go. Okay. So what does this mean for us? Well, it means that we need to understand that diseases, um, when you get a condition or a disease or whatever, it's going to affect the body system that it's associated with. So let's say that we get um, lung cancer, right? That's going to affect our respiratory uh, system because lung, you know, lungs are in the respiratory system. Lung cancer affects that. But the problem is that it's part of a bigger system. So even though lung cancer is going to affect our respiratory system, it's going to have an effect in other systems as well. So we have to think about what do the lungs actually do? Are the lungs bring in air and expel air? Well, why does it do that? Well, it needs to collect oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. So it kind of makes sense. So if we have a problem in the system, that means that we're probably gonna have a problem collecting oxygen or expelling carbon dioxide. So where would those extra things, the, those problems show up? Well, the whole reason we collect oxygen is to put it in the bloodstream for the rest of our body to use. And the whole reason that we expel CO2 is so it doesn't build up in the bloodstream, which could be bad. So if we have lung cancer, that means it's going to have an effect on the circulatory system that pushes all of that blood around and the blood itself. It's not limited to just the lungs. It's gonna have a bigger effect. Does that make sense? So we need to understand that all of these things are kind of interrelated. And this is um, an important foundation of nursing specifically, rather than medicine. So medicine is gonna focus here. Lung cancer, problem with the lungs, we're focusing here. We got to fix this. That's what medicine is going to focus on. Good morning. Nursing is going to take a step back from that. And say, yes, yes, yes. We have lung cancer. Medicine is working with that. But as nurses, we know that that's going to have a bigger effect on this whole body system. This is what makes nursing different from medicine. Even though we work together, it's a different focus. Does that make sense? Now, as CNAs, we are going to be working in nursing. So we're going to look at the whole thing, not focus right here. We're going to look at the whole thing. So if we're taking care of that patient with lung cancer, and we notice that, um, okay, they have lung cancer, but we notice that after they eat, it's getting really hard for them to breathe. Is that something that we should be reporting? Or we might notice when we're doing hand and nail care that the fingertips are a little bluish in color. Is that something we should be reporting? Okay, so as CNAs, 
we have to understand that when a patient has something that affects any one of these systems, we might actually see signs in other systems. And one of the, um, the most common ones that you guys will see is uh, involves the urinary system right here. When a young person gets a urinary tract infection, a UTI, we tend to uh, feel like we have to pee, but we can't. We're spending a lot of time in the bathroom. It's very irritating. It's a little bit painful, right? You know you've got a UTI if you've got a UTI. And we go to the doctor, we get put on antibiotics, and life is great again. The problem is that as we age, that system changes a little bit. And when we have a urinary tract infection, as an elderly person, we don't get those same symptoms. We don't get pain and urgency and frequency and burning. Those don't, don't appear. What does appear is confusion. So when we have an older person that we're caring for and they're a little more confused today than they have been, well, you're probably thinking, oh, that's a problem up here. They're getting old, they've got dementia, they're, you know, whatever. You're probably thinking up here and you may not report it especially if you think that all old people are confused, which is not the case, right? But actually, if you come to me and tell me, hey, Mr. McGillicuddy's a little more confused today than he has been, I'm not thinking here. I'm going to think down here and ask you to get me a urine sample because I understand how all of these things are connected. So the really important part of chapter four what I think they should lead with is you don't need to know what symptom indicates what disease. That's not your job. My job is to put those pieces together. Your job is to notice everything about the patient, everything, and report it even if you don't think it's important. Does that make sense? So observation and reporting really is the most important job that the CNA has to do. Yes, you're going to learn how to give a bed bath. Yes, you're going to learn how to do foot care. Yes, you're going to learn how to do range of motion. We've already learned vital signs, right? You, 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 you're learning the tasks. And the tasks are there to help the patient and help the nurses, but that's not the most important reason that you're there. Because if you don't report this, if the patient is confused today and you don't report that to me, what happens to the patient? Get worse. They get worse. Do you see how far apart these two things are? I mean, on a body, there's a long distance between these two, right? So if my problem is here, but I'm having symptoms there, that tells me that the problem is not just here anymore, is it? Because where are my symptoms? Yeah, way up in the brain. So that means somebody with a urinary tract infection who's having confusion now has that bacteria, that infectious agent, throughout their entire body. Now, if you aren't reporting that, that doesn't get fixed. And what could potentially happen to this patient? They can die. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, as a nurse, I may not notice that this guy's a little more confused because I only spend on average four minutes per shift with them. I may not pick that up. You spend all of this time with them doing foot care and hand and nail care and helping get him dressed and doing mouth care. You're spending time with them that I'm not. So you're going to be the one that picks that up, not me. So observation reporting really is the most important job that you have. And that's what chapter four really is all about. Okay, good. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I think that could be done just a little bit better because chapter four is a little overly complex. Remember those of you who are going on for nursing, um, you will have a lot of anatomy and physiology because that's our job. That is 100% our job. Remember, medicine's going to focus on the immediate problem. Nursing takes a step back and looks at how that problem affects the whole body. So we have to know the whole body, in and out, up and down. So we need um, we need to have a really good foundation in this for those folks that are going on. So any questions on that? Does that make sense? Is that a little bit better than what you read in chapter four? <laughs> All right. So let me talk about this really quick because this has been on my mind. This is, I don't make the rules. It's probably a good thing I don't make the rules. Um, but they just, uh, in the last couple of months, they just passed a law in Florida. We were one of the last states to get on board with this. But they are now going to allow CNAs with at least one year of experience that are working in nursing homes to take a 40 hour class and be able to pass medications, routine medications in a nursing home setting. And they're routine medications. You read the order, you get the medication, you give it to the patient. You know. And we already have this in assisted living. Okay, the model is there. We already have this system in place. But assisted living is not nursing. There's no nursing care involved in assisted living. Assisted living just means that you need a little help with showering and putting on your shoes. Well, your neighbor can do that next door at home. You know, this is this is not nursing care. This is personal care. Personal care and nursing care are two totally separate things. Remember, nurses are responsible for this, right? So if you are in a nursing home, that means that you've got a problem in one or more of these areas that we need to be keeping an eye on to make sure that we don't have problems in other areas because of this one. That's the whole reason for a nursing home is we have a known problem. We have to keep an eye on it to make sure that there aren't new problems or worsening problems. So that means that we really do need a nurse. That's why it's called a nursing home. Make sense? Good. Well, I just told you that nurses on average in nursing homes only spend four minutes with the patient. And most of that is giving medications. So now if we're allowing CNAs to do that, you're probably down to one minute of direct patient care in a nursing home. Now, I don't think that that's a good idea, personally. Particularly when CNAs don't have a really good grasp on the fact that most of their job is observation and reporting. If we're not doing that now, while we have nurses involved, then we really need to get on board with this when the nurses aren't in the room. Because how else are they going to know anything? They're not there. They're not in the room. Does that make sense? This is, for me as a nurse, this, this new, it's super scary. I don't like it. I don't like it. So that's why I'm spending a lot of time with you guys explaining observation and reporting. I know I sound like a broken record, but you have no idea how important this is going to become. Okay. So if you see something, say something. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't rationalize it. Don't think, well, yeah, they're old. They're supposed to be confused. Or yeah, they got lung cancer. Of course they can't breathe. That's not your judgment call to make. If you see something, say something. I think that taking that routine medication administration away from nurses 
is sent across things to be missed because that was the only time they were in the room. So I, I don't have a lot of faith in this. I, I know other states have implemented it, but it's a little scary for me. So get really, really good at your observation and reporting. All right, so let's go on to page 98. So page 98 is change position to supported sideline. How do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan. So this care plan says position the resident on his left side. So what side are we putting them on? Left. What if it says right? Right. Okay, so we're going to follow the care plan. care plan. So for the test, you need to pay attention to what your care plan says. It could be either. Could be either. Okay, they all aren't going to say left. It says patient requires support to remain on his side and is unable to assist with turning. Unable to assist with turning. That means we have to do it all. Okay. It doesn't say that they're unable to move in the bed. It doesn't say they're unable to scoot towards you. It doesn't say they're paralyzed. It doesn't say they're comatose. What does it say? They're unable to assist with turning. Do not read any more into this care plan than what is there. That's why it's care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the care plan. Because you might have a written test question that says your patient is unable to assist with turning. And if your brain automatically goes to this patient is comatose or immobile, you may answer the question wrong. The question is as it stands. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. All right. So it says that the uh, patient requires support to remain on their side after turning. So we are going to, this is actually a really easy skill. You're going to scoot a patient towards you so that after the turn, they're in the middle of the bed. We talked about that, right? So you're scooting a patient towards you, turn them on their side. We're going to put a pillow behind their back, one between their legs, one under their upper arm, and adjust the pillow under their head. We're going to put an opening in front of it. We're going to use a barrier on our table. We're going to evaluate if we need gloves. We'll use a privacy blanket so that we can get to the legs and the patient's not uncovered or undressed. We're not going to hold anything up next to our uniform, and we're going to do our closing like we always do. So you already know a lot of this skill. You know the care plan, you know the opening, you know barrier rules, glove rules, privacy blanket, linen rules, and the closing. You know a lot of this already. So what we have to get to is the actual physical turning the patient and putting the pillows in place, okay? But a lot of what you're going to be graded on, you already know. Good? Questions? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about side rails, immobility, and turning patients, okay? So go all the way back to page 91. All right, so one of the first things that we have to talk about is when you're turning a patient, you roll them away from you or towards you. And you'll see videos both ways on YouTube. You'll see information in textbooks both ways. But there is a correct way here. The first thing that we have to understand is when you're on your side, your weight is not proportionally distributed, which means it's half your weight isn't in the front and half in the back. Most of your weight is actually in the back. And if left alone, if you turn somebody on their side and you leave them in that position, gravity will always pull them onto their back. Always. 
That means that you have more weight distributed along your back. Make sense? Okay. So we need to understand that principle. When you turn somebody on your on their side, gravity is always going to try to pull them back onto their back. That's just gravity in you know on planet Earth. So if I move this, if I am going to turn this patient onto their side. And remember, you always scoot them towards you first, right? If I'm going to turn this patient onto their side and I roll them toward me like this, and gravity is going to try to pull them onto their back because that's what gravity does, right? Gravity's going to try to pull them onto their back. If gravity starts to win, I am too far away to stop that. Because as they are rolling that way, it's stretching me further and further and further. And what's going to happen? I, yeah, I'm going to end up injuring the patient. So you don't want to turn the patient towards you because gravity is going to try to pull them in the other direction. You will lose your leverage. So if you turn a patient away from you, so they're in the middle of the bed, if gravity tries to pull them back onto their back, you are in a position to be able to do something about it. Make sense? So when you're turning a patient, you always turn them away from you. And the way to remember this is we remain behind the patient's behind. Mm -hmm. Good. Questions? Okay, the other problem with turning a patient towards you, and there's no easy way to put this, guys, so I hope I don't offend anybody, but you never want to turn a patient so that they are eye level with your crotch. There's no, you know, I mean, it's just wrong on every level. If this patient has ever been a victim of any type of molestation or sexual abuse, that can trigger it. Remember, your patient is vulnerable. They are laying down and they are minimally dressed. This is a very vulnerable position for a patient. So you don't want to put them in that uncomfortable position. So anytime we turn a patient, we always turn them away from us. Good? Make sense? So it's for safety, but it's also for ethics. All right. So now, turn to, we've already gone over page 92, 93. Turn to page 94. All right, so our principle here is scoot and roll. And we've already talked a little bit about this um, on Monday, but you're not gonna have side rails in all settings. And I'm gonna talk to you about that in just a minute. But anytime we turn a patient, we're gonna scoot them toward us first and then roll them away from us so that we remain behind the patient's behind. But the patient is always in the middle of the bed after the turn. That's our key component there. The patient has to be in the middle of the bed after the turn. If they're too close to the edge, you must address it. Don't think to yourself, oh, that evaluator isn't going to see that they're close to the edge. Yes, they will. They're very, very good at what they do. Those evaluators make a living off of being good at what they do. So if you, who are brand new to the industry, think to yourself, oh, somebody with a ton of experience isn't going to see this, you're delusional. So if I turn a patient onto their side and they are too close to the edge of the bed, I got to work on my setup over here, and they are too close to the edge of the bed, And I put some pillows behind their back. You see how close they are to the edge of the bed? Right? 
If I put some pillows behind their back, that's going to push them even further toward the edge. Do you think this patient feels comfortable right now? Especially if they don't have the ability to stop a fall on their own. Man, that's like torture. So if you turn a patient and they're too close to the edge of the bed, that evaluator is going to see it. You must address it. So if you turn the patient over, put some pillows behind their back, and you look at them and go, oh, you're pretty close. Stop and redo it. Don't just leave it. Okay? Don't just leave it. All right, so let's talk about side rails. When you are a child, an infant, mom brings you home from the hospital and probably puts you in one of those things. What is that thing? Okay. What is that crib there to do? What, what is its job? Keep the baby from falling or falling out. Okay, yeah, safety, right? Keep the baby from falling out and onto the floor. So we have bars there for safety. And as long as the patient is just rolling, it does its job. But once the baby reaches about a year and a half old, they're no longer just rolling. They are now fully mobile. They sit, they stand, they crawl, and they are walking. So those bars that are there to prevent rolling are no longer effective. Because what is that one and a half year old going to do when you put them in a crib and they don't want to be there? They're going to climb out. Absolutely. So now this thing that was originally for safety and worked well for rolling safety is now an obstacle for them to climb. And if they fall, they're falling from a greater height. So even though this was originally designed for safety, is it safe for a mobile child? So what does mom do? She takes you out of the crib and puts you into a little toddler bed that's super near the floor. That way, if you roll, you're not going to fall far. And if she really likes you, she puts something soft on the floor, right? Like a blanket or a mat. Make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. So why do we care about this? Well, because we look at side rails the same way that mom looked at the crib. As long as your patient is rolling, side rails are effective. But if your patient is mobile and wants to get up, what are those side rails going to do? Yeah, they're going to present, present an obstacle. And if the patient falls, they're falling from a greater height, which gives more risk of injury. Side rails do not keep patients safe. You need to understand that. And unfortunately, CNAs are like the worst at this. Um, you cannot use side rails as a punishment. I drive up and down 19. And let me tell you, a lot of people on 19, I would like to give some driving lessons to. Right? I want to punish some of these people because they make me mad when they pull out in front of me or make a left-hand turn from the right-hand lane or do whatever other boneheaded things they do out there, right? I want to punish them. Do I have the right to punish any other adults no matter what they do to me on 19? No, no, I don't have that right. As a CNA, you don't have the right to punish another adult to do, even if they do any boneheaded thing, that is not your right. We do not punish. And yet a lot of CNAs out there think that that's what side rails are there to do, to punish the patient, to keep them confined. 
Now there's only three people, three types of people in America that can confine a person without their permission. And two of those are temporary. So a police officer can put you in handcuffs in the back of a patrol car and confine you without your permission. They can put you in a jail cell and confine you. But is that permanent? Do they get to make that decision like for a long time? No. If you get arrested, you always have to go in front of a judge. The judge and a jury of your peers together will decide your punishment. This is not a one person thing, right? So police officer can confine you temporarily. The judge and jury is what makes it permanent. Make sense? Good. A doctor can also confine you temporarily, but who would need to be available to make it permanent? Same person, a judge. So the only two types of people that can confine you temporarily are police officers and doctors. But it takes a judge to make it any longer. Okay, do you guys understand that legal principle? So as a CNA, if you decide that you're going to put side rails up on a patient's bed and you don't have that doctor's permission, you are operating outside of the law. It is called false imprisonment. If I grabbed one of you right now and put you in my back closet and closed the door and put a lock on the outside and locked you in that room, is that legal? No, and not only would you run out of here screaming, you would tell everybody in the world about it, and you'd probably sue me, right? I'd probably go to jail for false imprisonment. But yet we do that with healthcare patients all the time and don't think twice about it. We put patients in beds and put side rails up. We threaten to put patients in seclusion. We close their door to keep them in their rooms. Guys, that is false imprisonment. You cannot do any of that. You guys understand how important that is? Mm -hmm. So in order to use side rails on a patient's bed, we have to have a doctor's order, have to. Uh, not only do we have to get a doctor's order, that doctor has to come in and physically eyeball that patient within four hours of giving us the order. So if you call a doctor at midnight and say, hey, Harry's up running around acting crazy. I need to put side rails up. That doctor is probably going to tell you, well, walk him up and down the hallway, do what you need to do, but you're not getting that side rail order because I'm not coming in between now and 4 a.m. to eyeball him. So what really that what happens here in the vast majority of cases is that CNAs use side rails as a convenience when they're not needed, but they justify it in their own minds. So let me give you some examples of this. If we have this patient right here who has dementia and it is 2 a.m. and she's supposed to be in bed sleeping, and she gets out of bed. You put her back in bed and she gets out of bed. You put her back in bed and she gets out of bed. Does this patient need side rails? What do you guys think? No. I got some maybes over here. I got some people that are thinking about it. Okay, so let me ask you this. If you can't sleep in the middle of the night, are you allowed to get up and wander your house? Mm -hmm. Is there anybody standing there as, as an adult? Is there anybody standing there saying you can't get out of bed and then tying you to the bed? Mm -hmm. No, 
you have the freedom to get up and, and go anywhere you want to if you can't sleep. At what age are you willing to give up that right? Never. Yeah, never, right? Never. Patients do not have to go to bed at a certain time. Patients do not have to stay in bed because you think they should. That is your mindset, not their right. We have to be careful not to confuse those. A lot of CNAs will try to use side rails to keep patients in bed. A patient doesn't need a side rail to keep them in bed. They don't want to be in bed. Walk them. Get them involved in the activity. They aren't tired. Another reason that we use side rails is for safety. Now, I love this one. If a patient is a fall risk, right? If we're afraid if they get up and walk by themselves, they might fall and they're a fall risk. They're weak, they're unsteady, whatever the case may be. Um, we tell them to use their call light. Call us when they need us. We go in and we help them. But do we always answer those call lights immediately as they go off? No, we should, but we're busy with other patients. We're short staff. So sometimes those call lights are going to go off for a little while. So let's think about that for a second. This patient is a fall risk. She has the key. She hits the call light. And she's 82. Now, as you get older, your ability to hold the P decreases over time. So she's 82 and she has to pee. And she hit the call light because she's a good girl. And she's waiting. And she's waiting. And she's waiting. And she really has to pee. And she's still waiting. Now she's left with two choices here. She can either get up out of bed and try to make her way to the bathroom, or yeah. she can pee herself. Which do you think she is going to do? Yeah, because that's what she has done her entire life. So she's going to get out of bed and walk to the bathroom. Now, she might fall. She might make it. I don't know. But let's assume that she makes it to the bathroom. You finally come in and you see her walking her way back to the bed and you immediately jump all over her. I told you not to get up by yourself. I told you that, that you're a fall risk. I told you, I, 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 I. Is it ever about us? No. no. We fail to understand that the patient had a need that wasn't met and we're going to punish them for trying to meet that need when it's really our fault. So now you're mad at her. And you tell the nurse, I need side rails because she is getting up all by herself and that's not allowed. So the nurse calls the doctor and we get a side rail order for her. So we just punished her for taking care of her own needs because we didn't answer the call light. Are we ever allowed to punish? No. And we'll justify it by saying, well, we don't want her to fall. We don't want her to fall. Sounds reasonable. But the problem is that if somebody is confined to bed and isn't allowed to get up, what is that going to do to their muscles over time? Make them weak. Okay, so if we've got somebody with a fall risk and we confine them to bed, did we do anything to improve the risk? So did it really help? No, in fact, within three days, we can make that patient bed down for the rest of their lives. That is a huge amount of power to have over somebody. A huge amount of power. Are you willing to give anybody the ability to make you bed bound for the rest of your life? Think about that. Activity is essential. It is important. And we don't have the right to take that away. Does that make sense? I'm actually gonna be talking about this tomorrow on my live, um, the whole patient right to fall. Um, I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow in my live lesson. But it all has to do with this. Okay. So side rails are not what you think they are. 
We can't use them to keep the patient in bed. We can't use them to punish a patient. We can't restrict the patient's mobility. And we can't use them in the name of safety. So side rails have very specific rules around them because otherwise we tend to go off the rails and do things on our own. So in order to use side rails, we need a doctor's order. The doctor has to physically come in and look at the patient within four hours of giving that order. And we have to check on the patient every 15 minutes and get them up and moving every two hours around the clock. There's a lot of rules that go along with side rails because we understand the risks here. There are very big real world risks here. So we can't use side rails the way we used to. Now that means that your, most of your beds aren't even gonna have side rails on them because we can't trust you, especially night shift. Night shift will put those side rails up without thinking twice about it because they think all patients need to be in bed. So we can't even have side rails on the beds because we can't trust that you're going to do the right thing. So when you're turning a patient, you can't rely on side rails to keep your patient from falling out of the bed because they're not even going to be there. If I get a side rail order for this patient, I have to have maintenance come up and install the side rails for me. Make sense? Okay. So when we're turning a patient, we cannot rely on side rails. Side rails are considered a restraint. That will be on the written test. Okay. Let's talk about the difference between side rails and positioning rails. because one of these things is not like the other. So when you have a bed, um, a long-term care bed, you usually have these half rails at the top and then you have uh, half rails at the bottom as well. The half rails at the top are not considered side rails. So let me show you over here. These are positioning rails. So this rail right here this rail right here has handholds on it to help the patient turn over in bed, boost themselves up, sit up straight, whatever they need to do, help them, you know, sit up in bed to get out. These are positioning rails. This does not impact the patient's ability to get out of bed because the patient can swing their legs out in this open area. This is not a side rail. But if I put this one up, that's going to impact the patient's ability of getting out of bed. Now they have to scoot all the way to the end to try to get out of that little space. Or they got to try to get through here. They're probably going to get pinched. If you have side rails up and it's interfering with your patient's ability to get out of bed as they wish, you increase the risk for injury. Side rails were killing several hundred people a year. So we had to figure out another way of doing this. Okay. So this is a positioning rail or half rail. This would be a side rail. So the only time in medicine that we're allowed to use side rails without a doctor's order is if the bed is in motion physically moving. If we are moving that bed with a patient in it down a hallway, then we can use side rails. It has to be physically in motion, but those beds are heavy. I mean, that bed weighs about 700 pounds and it doesn't roll all that well. It tends to roll into walls and elevators and all kinds of stuff. So we don't usually move those beds very often. Now we have stretchers. So we would transfer the patient out of bed into a stretcher, take them where they need to go. That reduces the need for side rails on these beds. Okay. You guys understand 
the pitfalls of side rails. Side rails are considered a restraint. And what do you need to be able to use them? Yeah, not a good reason. <laughs> That's not the answer. <laughs> we need a doctor's order. Okay. So now let's talk about immobile patients. Go to page 96. Now we already talked about this earlier. Wrinkles lead to what? Bed sores. Wrinkles lead to bed sores. So when you're sleeping at night, you toss and turn so that those areas that are flat on the, the mattress surface um, are able to kind of move around, uh, get blood flow to the area, open up because they're no longer compressed. This is why you toss and turn. This is why you fidget in class as well. Um, and that's perfectly normal and it's healthy and it's good because we need circulation for all of our tissues. But if you're unable to move on your own, we need to understand that that is a real problem. If the patient can't fidget on their own, then we need to be fidgeting for them. And in this case, that means we're going to turn them. Okay. And we have a very specific turning schedule. It's every two hours around the clock. So we're waking them up at 2 a.m. and turning them on their side. We're waking them up at 4 a.m. and putting them back on their back. We're waking them up at 6 a.m. putting them on their side. 8 a.m. back on their back. And this is the turning schedule we use. It's back, right, back, left, back, right, back, left, back, right, back, left, right? Um, so it, it's it's very prescribed. Now you can actually uh, put a turning clock, make a turning clock on the, the wall, you know, easy to do. Um, but notice I didn't ever say to put them on their stomach. Unless the care plan specifically tells you to put a patient on their stomach, you should never put an immobile patient on their stomach because if they lack the muscle strength or the nerve innervation to lift off of their chest cavity, how are their lungs going to inflate? So we can effectively suffocate somebody by putting them on their stomach. That's not good. So unless the care plan specifically says to put them on their stomach, we don't. Make sense? So let me show you how quickly this can occur though. I want you to take one hand, doesn't matter which hand, and I want you to put it underneath your leg. So I want you to sit on your hand for the next two minutes. And you're gonna wanna pull it out. I'm gonna ask you not to, okay? I want you to do a full two minutes here. And I'm gonna tell you when, um, you know, when you can pull it out. But this um, experiment is designed to show you just how quickly uh, pressure sores can develop, how quickly we see skin changes. So when you're laying down in bed, right? So if I have a bed and my body is laying down on that bed, Gravity is, is working from down here, pulling everything down. So all of my skin surfaces that are in contact with this book, everything is being pulled down through. So my bones are being pulled down. My muscles are being pulled down. The more weight you have here, the more it's gonna affect the surface area. So if I put a big book on top of here, it's going to affect the skin even more, okay? So weight is gonna have a bearing on this. But we need to understand that this is the part that we need to be concerned about because all of that is being pushed through this area, okay? If I turn, now this area is getting good blood flow and all of that weight is being pushed through here. If I turn again, all of that weight is now being pushed through. So what we're doing is distributing that weight back and forth so it doesn't impact these areas. Because when you have an area that's consistently being pulled down through, those blood vessels are going to squish. That means no blood is going to get through. What happens to tissue that doesn't get blood? 
it dies. It dies. That's right. So you got one more minute. I know this is a long time. Two minutes is a long time. And you're probably getting antsy. You probably won't pull your hand out by now. Please don't. So what happens is those blood vessels squish, 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 and we don't get good blood flow. But what else happens is the muscles squish, which means that the fluid inside the muscles is going to be pushed out. So now we don't have any buffers, any bumpers. So now those bones are actually able, because that liquid isn't there anymore. It's been pushed out. So now those bones are able to really bite into that muscle tissue and through it and into the skin. You see how that could be bad? Okay, go ahead and take your hand out and take a look at it. Do you have color changes? Is your hand red? Yeah. All right, look really close now, really close. Do you see the pattern of your clothing or the chair? Can you see that? The pattern of your clothing or your chair? Don't show. That was two minutes, guys. Those lines developed in your skin. They actually pushed into your skin in two minutes. Can you imagine how deep those lines would be after two hours? If two minutes left lines, how much deeper are they going to be in two hours? If you go even further, four hours, six hours, those lines can actually cut through the skin. And that is how a bed sore forms. A bed sore can actually form in as little as 20 minutes in the right conditions. Remember, you're healthy and you got lines at two minutes. 20 minutes in an unhealthy patient, somebody that has circulation problems, or is dehydrated or has bony prominences where their bones are really sticking into those muscles. 20 minutes is all it takes. So we are going to generally turn a patient every two hours around the clock. But if my patient has risk factors, that care plan may say every hour around the clock. What are we gonna follow? The care plan. The care plan. So this is our turning clock. I said you could make one on your own. So every two hours, we're going to turn the patient from their side to their back and then the other side. So right, back, left, back, right, back, left, back. So you should always know based on what time it is where your patient should be. Please don't skip this. A lot of CNAs will let their patients sleep through the night because they don't want to wake them up in the middle of the night to change their position. If you don't change this patient's position, they will develop a bed sore. They will, not might, they will. So it's super important that we adhere to this, even if it means we're waking our patients up multiple times during the night. Okay. So any questions? Once you turn a patient on their side, we're gonna use some pillows to keep them in that position. And that's just so gravity doesn't have a chance to pull them over, but it's also like between the knees and the ankles so those bony areas can't rub together. Remember, as bony areas are touching or touching the surface of the, the bed, Remember that that squishes the muscles and that push, pushes the fluid out. So you don't want those bony areas to press together because it can erode the skin. So we're gonna use some pillows. But as far as the actual turning goes, if I'm gonna turn somebody, you can actually turn somebody three times your body weight without any stress on them or you, as long as you do it properly, as long as you set it up right. And the way that we set it up right 
if we have a patient laying in bed like this, we've scooted them toward us because we always scoot them toward us. So they remain in the middle of the bed after the turn. We've scooted them toward us. The closest arm crosses their chest like this. The furthest arm goes up over their head like this. So your patient will look like this. If I were on the other side of the bed, the patient would look like this. Right? So cro closest arm crosses, furthest arm up. With the legs, the closest knee is bent with a foot flat on the bed. The furthest knee is angled. When you do this, when you move all four extremities, it takes no effort to roll them on their side because you've already started the rolling process with the extremities. The core goes very easily and it prevents a lot of stress on you and the patient when you get it set up properly. Make sense? Is this good? Got it? Mm -hmm. um, when you position them like that, that's when they're in the center of the bed? Or You're gonna have them scoot them? towards you, Okay. And then arm you up, over, knee bent, knee angled, and then you roll them. So after the roll, they're in the middle of the bed. Got it. Yep, good, very good. Good observation. All right, so here are here's our um, testing tips for this particular skill. We're going to scoot the patient toward us. The furthest arm goes up. The closest arm crosses the chest. Remember, all the C's go together. Closest crosses chest. Closest knee is bent with the foot on the bed, and the furthest knee is angled out. We're gonna roll a patient to the middle of the bed, put a pillow behind their back, put a pillow between the legs, put a pillow under the top arm and adjust the pillow under the head. Okay. So these are our steps, but we're gonna follow the care plan. We're gonna do our opening. We're going to decide if we need gloves. We're gonna use a barrier for our pillows and we're gonna do the closing. We also wanna make sure we're using a privacy blanket and we're not holding those pillows up against our uniform because of linen rules. Good. So I'm going to show you the video for this one. Does anybody have any questions about what we've gone over with side rails, immobile patients, how often you need to turn a patient? Anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so if you look at the bottom of your page, how much time on uh, page 98, how much time does the state test give you for this skill? Eight minutes. We're just turning somebody on their side and putting some pillows there. So you'll notice that I get this completely done in five. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. I need to turn you on to your left side. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain for privacy. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay. I'll start gathering your supplies. We'll start with a barrier, which I'll place on the table to provide a clean area to place my supplies. And I'll 
get three pillows from clean supply cabinet, being careful not to allow them to touch my uniform. Mr. Jones, I'm going to place this blanket over you, and this will help keep you warm and protect your privacy while we do this skill. Once I have the blanket in place, then I'll pull the sheet down underneath the blanket, making sure the patient remains covered at all times. Okay, Mr. Jones, if I can have you scoot toward me, please. I'm gonna place your furthest arm above your head and cross your closest arm over your chest. I'm going to bend the closest knee and put the foot flat on the bed. And I'm gonna angle the furthest knee out a little bit. Okay, now I'm going to turn you onto your side. One, two, three. Okay, I'm going to take the first pillow and put it in an angle up against the back, and I'm going to tuck this top edge underneath the patient by pushing down on the pillow and under his back. This edge will roll up, and then it too will be pushed down and under, forming a roll along the back. Okay, now I'm going to position a pillow between the two legs. by lifting the top leg and laying the pillow lengthwise between the two legs, specifically between the knees and the ankles to prevent those bony areas from rubbing together. This pillow is gonna be placed underneath the upper arm. This will help keep the arm in a neutral position as the patient remains on their side. And then I'm gonna adjust the pillow underneath the head to make sure that it's not under the shoulder and it remains only under the head and the neck. And then move the arm to a more comfortable position. Is that comfortable, Mr. Jones? Yes. Okay, I'm going to place the call light directly in your hand. Are you comfortable? Yes. Can I get you anything else while I'm here? No. Okay, let me pull your sheet up. And remove the privacy blanket. Be careful not to dislodge all of those pillows as I do so. I'll roll the privacy blanket up and place it in dirty lint. The barrier will be thrown away. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to open your privacy curtain now. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, I'll see you soon. Let me go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review all the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Be able to step to my skill, make it correctly, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, any questions on that one? Um, the little behind the back. Um, when you tuck it under, are you supposed to sort of smooth it out kind of because of the wrinkle called the door type situation? Or? Yeah, you don't want the pillowcase like all bunched up, but right. you're not going to be able to get anything completely wrinkle free just because there's a body in the bed. Right. So that back pillow is the hardest one. You want to tuck it up underneath the patient as, as tight as you can get it. And that's going to have the pillow, if you do it right, it should be kind of 
this edge should be kind of sticking up in the air. You're going to roll that over and tuck that under the patient. And when you do that, um, try to, to tuck it so that the, the pillowcase is smoother. Right. You're never going to get it completely smooth because of the, the body in the bed. Right. Okay. So one other thing with this particular skill, there is a checkpoint that I wanted to bring to your attention for this one. And that checkpoint is a, at the very end of the checklist. So right down here. It says, leave call light in or near resident's hand on side turned toward. So what that means is when you're, you're ending the skill, when you're doing your closing and you're giving them the call light, you've got to make sure that that call light is actually on that side of the bed, not behind them over here. You also want to make sure that the call light doesn't cross their neck. So what I mean by that is if I have this patient, let me go see, you can't see. No, wrong way. Okay, if I have this patient in bed, I scoot her toward me, I do the whole arm up, she doesn't move that way, arm up, arm crossed, and you get the legs ready, and I turn her on her side, and um, I put the pillows in place and do all that. And I'm getting ready to end the skill. I can't take the call light and do this. I can't bring it over their body. Why would that be important? Maybe choke them. That's right. Yeah, they can get tangled up in it. It can choke them, especially if it migrates up here over their neck. So when this checkpoint is, the call light needs to be on the side they they are turned toward but what they're looking for here is that you don't drape the call light over the patient you want to bring it around the head of the bed and then give it put it directly in their hand does that make sense questions really important checkpoint because it's a safety checkpoint all right, any questions on sideline position? We're gonna take our break a little bit early today um, because we're gonna get into foot care next. And that's, uh, I've got to talk to you about diabetes and that's a pretty long lecture. So we're gonna take our break a little bit early before we get into that so that I don't break in the middle, okay? So go ahead and take uh, 15 minutes, come back at uh, 35 after.
Okay, question we just had on uh, the YouTube uh, the YouTube group. Why does this keep shutting off? Oh, that's why. Hold on, guys, I'm waiting on my sound. Okay, testing one. Okay, now we're up. All right, so one of the questions I had on uh, the YouTube uh, this morning is there another word that we can use other than scoot? So slide, shift, move. Um, you can use whatever word you want. It doesn't have to be scoot, but you know, just kind of move toward me. Um, so however you want to term that is fine. All right, so we're going to move on to page 84 now. You guys remember hand and nail care? Yeah, foot care is hand and nail care, just a little bit lower. But we aren't gonna do anything with, with toenails. Toenails are not our problem. Most facilities have a podiatrist or foot doctor that comes in and we'll see patients that need toenail um, trimming, grinding, cleaning, whatever needs to be done. So that's not our job. We don't do toenails. But we do foot care to see if there's a toenail issue that needs to be reported to the nurse because podiatrists come in once a month, but they don't go room to room. Do you need me? Do you need me? Do you? They don't do that. They go in, they get a list, they see the people on the list. That's it. So how does the patient get on the list? Yeah, by us, we report it. We do foot care, notice there's an issue, we report it to the nurse, the nurse puts them on a list, the podiatrist sees them. So part of foot care is going to be looking at the foot. In fact, you have to say, I'm looking at the foot. <laughs> or you can say, I don't see any skin issues or I don't notice any, any abnormality. However you wanna term it is fine, but those evaluators need to know that you understand why you're there. It's not about cleaning the foot. It's about having an opportunity to see the foot because feet are usually in socks and shoes. In fact, that's a rule. If the patient's feet hit the floor, we talk about their shoes, right? So we have to make sure the patient has shoes on anytime they're out of bed that protects the feet. So if people are um, have their feet covered all the time, how in the world are we gonna know that there's an issue unless we're physically inspected? That's what foot care is about. It's not about getting the feet clean. It's about observing the skin, having an opportunity to observe the skin. Now, it used to be years ago, we just told CNAs, hey, make sure you look at everybody's feet every shift. And the CNA would walk in the room and go, yeah, I got to look at your feet. You've got feet. Okay. I don't know what that was about. You know, and, and, and they didn't do what they were supposed to do. So if you don't do what we ask you to do, we're going to create a skill for you. And that's what foot care is. It's a skill of washing the foot, but the whole purpose is to look at the foot, okay? So this care plan says, provide foot care to one foot using soap and water. The resident is sitting in a chair and their sock and shoe should be replaced at the end of the skill. Now I wanna talk about that last sentence for a second. 
If you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see that this is a live patient skill. That means one of you guys might be a patient for this skill. I know nobody wants their feet washed. I get it. Nobody wants to. Yeah, nobody wants to be a patient for mouth care. Nobody wants to be a patient for foot care. I get it. But you might be a patient for foot care. You probably aren't going to take an extra set of socks with you to the testing center. You probably don't have a set in your pocket, right? So in a clinical setting, if we wash a foot, we're going to put on clean socks, right? Clean body deserves clean clothes. But for the test, we don't have clean socks available, which is why the care plan says replace their sock and shoe at the end of the skill. Good? Questions? When you're putting a sock on, what do you probably want to uh, make sure there that we don't have? Okay, wet feet. Yeah, make sure it's dry. What leads to bed sores? Wrinkles. wrinkles. So make sure you smooth that sock to make sure that it's wrinkle free. So whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. Right? We're going to put lotion on. What do we have to do after we put lotion on? Wipe off the excess. So you already know these steps. There's nothing new to learn here, except for diabetes. <laughs> we have to talk about diabetes when it comes to foot care because that's the main reason that we're doing this. So if you look at, if you compare foot care and hand and nail care, you're gonna see that there's a lot of similarities here, right? We're gonna do our opening, we're going to get our water. We're going to check it. Who else checks it? Who checks the water? The patient checks the water. Okay. We're going to uh, soak the hand in the basin. We're going to soak the foot in the basin. We're going to take the hand out to wash it. We're going to take the foot out to wash it. We're going to put the hand back in the basin to rinse. We're going to put the foot back in the basin to rinse. We're going to take the hand out to dry. We're going to take the foot out to dry. So it's, it's very, very similar. The big difference is here is that we're not going to put lotion between the toes because warm, dark, moist. And we don't clean the nails or file the nails on the toes. So we get to skip the whole nail part. But other than that, they're very, very similar. Same process. So we're going to learn a new principle here, and this is shoe rules. And our number one shoe rule is if the patient's feet hit the floor, we have to talk about their shoes. So for this, the shoe is going to be off, but at the end of the scale, we're going to put it back on. Okay, um, and that's kind of an important principle, but let me explain to you why shoes are important. Has anyone ever, well, I've asked this before, have you ever been a patient at a hospital, right? When you're a patient in the hospital, they give you a hospital gown, fashionable, right? And they give you those slipper socks. Anybody ever get out of bed with those slipper socks? Where'd you walk? Okay, to the bathroom. Where else did you go? Okay, down the hallway to a chair. Yeah, absolutely. Um, our local hospital down the road here, the closest one, they have a subway in the hospital. And every time I go in there, I see patients in the subway, right, with those little slipper socks on. So patients will walk all over the place. They're not, you know, it's not a locked unit. You can come and go as you please. So when they're done walking, wherever it is that they're going to walk, where do they get back in, into? Into bed. What are they wearing? Those slipper socks. And what do those slipper socks come into contact with? Everything. So are those slipper socks clean? Oh, we didn't think about that when we were out walking around with those slipper socks on, did we? No, you just walk around, you get back into bed and all of those pathogens get right back into bed with you. And as you move around, because we already know that we toss and turn all night long, right? As we move around, those pathogens off of our socks are going to move higher and higher and higher on the sheet. 
And if we have an incision anywhere, an incision is warm, dark, moist. So where are those pathogens going to try to get in? Yeah, that's right. So now we end up with some sort of an infection. Does that help? So we need to be aware that the infection control risk with slipper socks is severe, okay? So when a patient's out walking around, what should they have on? Shoes, something between those slipper socks they're gonna wear into bed and the floor, absolutely. So it's important that we understand that there's an infection control aspect to this. But those slipper socks did not protect against sharp objects. Do we use any sharp objects in healthcare? Yeah, in fact, it's the one place that you're guaranteed to find sharp objects. Probably not gonna find any at the bank, you know. It's the one place that we know sharp objects exist. Is it possible that sometimes needles might roll onto the floor and go unnoticed? So would you let a child walk around in that setting barefoot? Why? Because they might step on something. If you're not willing to let a child walk in that environment barefoot, then why are you willing to let an adult? Shoes are essential, but we tend to forget that. We think hospital slipper socks are good to go. That's not the case. Slipper socks are not enough, okay? We always have to have shoes on, but there's another reason. And it has to do with diabetes. And I'm gonna tell you a story to help illustrate this, okay? So years and years ago, I was a agency nurse. Now agency nurses are substitute nurses. Just like in high school, you had a substitute teacher when your teacher couldn't show up, agency nurses are substitute nurses. You're sent in when there's no other nurse available. So I don't work at the facility, not my patients. And I'm assigned to this uh, rehab. They it was half rehab and half nursing home. So I'm assigned on the rehab side. I go in, get my assignment, find out about my patients. And I walk into the patient's room, first patient, and his name is Henry. And when I walked in the room, the room was very dark. It had one small light above the bed, just one small fluorescent light. I walk in and I flip the light on and I said, hi, Henry, I'm Patty, I'm your nurse today. And he starts yelling right away, turn it off, turn it off, turn off the light. So I turned the light off and I approached the bed and I said, hey, Henry, why don't we want the light on? Do you have a headache or something? What's going on? This is part of my assessment, right? So he says, no, 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 I've got diabetic retinopathy and the bright light really hurts my eyes. And I said, okay, no problem. So I'm standing there with a cup of pills and I'm having a conversation because I'm kind of getting to know him a little bit and figuring out what I need to assess. And um, as I'm standing there, I get an odor. And if you've ever smelled a wound, they're very distinctive. It's a specific smell. So as we're talking, I pull out my report sheet and I'm looking at it and I don't see anything on there about a wound, no assessment, no wound care orders, no nothing. Oops. <laughs> so I said, Henry, I think you've got a wound brewing somewhere. Can I take a quick peek? He says, do what you gotta do. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Henry. Henry was in his mid fifties, pretty young to be in this setting. And he was um, diabetic and he had had a, um, a surgery that was not healing well, okay? So that's why he was in the rehab side for physical therapy, but also for frequent assessments of the uh, wound that wasn't healing. So I turn him over and I look at all the usual suspects. I look at the back of the head, the shoulder blades, the um, lower back or coccyx area, the hip bones, I get down the back of his legs and I'm not seeing a whole lot that makes me sit up and take notice. I get down to his feet and he's got those slipper socks on, you know, the ones that have the little white dots on the bottom of them. 
And I said, Henry, I need to take your socks off for a second. And he immediately barks, no. Okay, why not? Now this is my red flag. If he's telling me no, and he knows I'm looking for a wound. If he's telling me no, what did he tell the CNAs? Yeah, and nobody had reported it. So we have no idea how long this guy had gone when nobody looking at his feet, no idea. So I sweet talk him because you can always get further with patients by being nice than being mean. So I turn up the charm and I get him to allow me to take his socks off. And I took the right sock off and the foot was flaky, needed a little lotion, but not in bad shape. I take the left or I try to take the left sock off and it stuck to the bottom of his foot. Found it. <laughs> So I go get a basin of warm salt water. We call it normal saline, but a basin of warm salt water. I put the whole foot in it, sock and all. And I go wash my hands, leave the room, go take care of some other patients, come back 10, 15 minutes later, take the foot out of the basin. And now I'm going to take the sock off. And it still was kind of stuck a little bit to the bottom of the foot. So I had to give a little bit of pressure, upward pressure to get it off. And as I did, something came off of his foot. So I'm counting toes. All the toes are there. That's good. So what came off of his foot? Well, I start looking around and it was floor like this. It was very speckled, you know, with the, the same baseboards as plasticky type institutional baseboards. So it looked a lot like this. And it took me a minute to find it. But I did finally find it. And it was up near the baseboard. But it was one of these, a flat white whoops, painted thumbtack and that was in his foot that was in his foot this is not the thumbtack by the way there's one like it but this was in his foot and um it left behind an area about this big around that was hard black dead tissue now we're good in medicine and we can heal a lot of things. We've got some great treatments, great medications. We can do a lot of great things, but dead is dead. We're not Dr. Frankenstein. We can't bring things back from the dead. This hard black dead tissue is a problem. So I called the family. I called the doctor. I got wound care orders, arranged for a wound care consult went in and cleaned it up, did my treatment, all of that. And then I documented and I left because it's not my patient, not my facility. And it was months and months and months before I went back, probably eight, nine months, close to a year later. I get sent back to that facility and this time I'm on the long-term care side and I'm getting report and I see Henry's name. So this guy wasn't able to go home. How old did I say he was? In his 50s, yeah, he wasn't able to go home. He was transferred to long-term care. That's sad. That's way too sad to be, in, or way too young to be institutionalized. I mean, institutionalized is not good at any age, but 50s is way too young. So I go in and, uh, hey, Henry, I'm Patty. I'm the nurse that found the wound on your foot. How are you doing? And he pulls the sheet aside and he had lost his leg. And that was really tragic to me for a couple of different reasons. You know, 50s is way too young to lose a limb. I mean, that, that's just like mind boggling. That's horrible. But what was really sad for me is that it was completely preventable. Because if this guy had had shoes on when he was walking, where would the thumbtack be? We don't amputate shoes. He would still have his leg. That's sad. So some of you are asking, well, wait a minute, hold up. If he had a thumbtack in his foot, how did he not know it was there? I mean, this story doesn't seem real. But I gave you a really big clue. I said that he had diabetic retinopathy. That means that he has diabetes. So how does diabetes keep you from feeling a thumbtack in your foot? How is that even possible? So now we're gonna talk about diabetes so you can understand why 
Henry did not feel that thumbtack. So your cells, all of the cells in your body run on fuel. You have to have fuel for your cells, just like your car. The main source of fuel for your cells is sugar. When we eat carbs, those carbs break down into sugar. The sugar goes into the cells and the cells operate well. Make sense? Now, carbs in our society get a bad rap. Carbs are not bad. Carbs are fuel. They're not bad. Carbs in excess are bad. That's where we get into trouble because carbs are good. <laughs> Most of our diet is carb focused, okay? Because they taste good. Tell me Cheetos don't, don't taste good, <laughs> right? Carbs are good. But the problem is that because carbs taste good, that we generally eat a lot of them. So it's important to understand that sugar has to be either used or stored. It isn't excreted. If you take in too much vitamin C, your body will pee out what it doesn't use. But it doesn't work that way with sugar. So when you take in carbs, it breaks down into, uh, those carbs break down into sugar. The sugar goes into the bloodstream. The cells use what it can. And then anything that's left over, the body puts in a box, packages it up, and the box is called glycogen, and puts it into a storage unit called a fat cell. Your fat cells store glycogen, they get full, we move to a new fat cell. Stores glycogen, it gets full, we move to a new fat cell. Good? Make sense? Okay. So it's important to understand that sugar has to be used or stored. It cannot be excreted. But that's only half the story. So when you eat sugar, or eat carbs, breaks down into sugar, that sugar can't just enter the cell all by itself. It has to have a key. Now that key is actually made right inside your body. It's called insulin. Your pancreas makes insulin. So you eat carbs, the body breaks it down into sugar. The brain says, hey, pancreas, we need some keys. The pancreas produces insulin. The insulin opens the cell. The sugar goes into the cell. Everybody's happy. A great system. Good. Okay. But that sugar can't get into the cell without insulin. Ah, this is where we run into a problem. Okay. So the cells are starving. They need fuel. They send a message to the brain. The brain tr triggers a craving, you eat, that carb breaks down into sugar, the pancreas produces insulin, the insulin opens the door to the cell and the sugar enters. So there's three components here. There's sugar that we need for fuel. There's insulin that the pancreas creates, and there's the brain that's going to regulate all of this. Okay. When we have diabetes, the problem is that those doors remain locked. There's no key. So we, the cell is starving, the brain triggers a craving. We eat carbs, carbs break down into sugar but they can't get into the cell. The cell is still starving. Cell tells the brain, I'm still starving. The brain triggers a craving. The patient gets hungry, eats carbs. The carbs break down into sugar, but the sugar can't get into the cell. So the cell is still starving, tells the brain, I'm starving. So what ends up happening here is that the body is not working properly. It's not metabolizing these uh, sugar molecules. The cells are still starving, but the brain doesn't know that the system is broken. So the patient eats and eats and eats and eats and eats, and 
remember that sugar can't be excreted. It has to be used by the cell or stored. You guys see? So what happens when you run out of storage units? That's right. Absolutely. It stays in your bloodstream. Have you ever? So sugar is a crystal. Okay. It's a crystal. Have you ever seen a cake or a cupcake left out on the counter for a couple of days? What happens to the frosting? Yeah, it hardens. It kind of separates, gets a little oily and a little crystallized, right? But it hardens, right? That's what happens to the sugar inside your bloodstream when it can't go into a cell. And it actually kind of looks something like this. Do you want that in your bloodstream? That could be a problem. That could be a problem. So where is it? There it is. OK. So this is what happens when we don't have good glucose utilization. So we're born with blood vessels like this. This is a nice blood vessel. I want my blood vessels to look like this. It doesn't at all. <laughs> but our blood vessels don't stay like this. And part of this is because of the American diet. Okay, let me explain to you what I mean. Carbs are not bad. Carbs taste good. Okay? But remember that every carb you eat causes your pancreas to have to produce insulin. So when we get into our 60s and 70s, a lot of Americans develop diabetes and they think, well, I never had diabetes before. Where did this come from? This actually started when you were two. So when you were little and you got up at six o'clock in the morning and mom wasn't ready to get up and she stumbles out of bed onto the couch, turns on TV for you, she's probably gonna hand you a Pop-Tart, just keep it quiet. So she can nap on the couch until a more civilized time. That Pop-Tart is carbs. Carbs break down into sugar. That causes the pancreas to produce insulin, right? So our pancreas is already off and running. About 7, 30, 8 o'clock, mom finally wakes up and it's more civilized. So now it's time for breakfast and the child gets a bowl of cereal. Now children do not eat all bran. What do they eat? Yeah, Fruity Pebbles, Captain Crunch, right? Tricks, all of those good, yummy cereals, but those are all carbs that break down into sugar that causes your pancreas to produce insulin, okay? And then child gets a mid-morning snack, probably some fruit. Mom's a good mom, give the child some fruit, but the fruit are all carbs that break down into sugar that causes the pancreas to produce insulin. Then we have lunch. So we're gonna have the American toddler diet of chicken nuggets and mac and cheese, which are carbs. Now the chicken is protein, but the coating is not, the ketchup is not, the mac and cheese is not. So we got a lot of carbs on board, which makes the pancreas produce insulin. Then we have an afternoon snack. So maybe a cookie or something like that, which are carbs making the, the pancreas produce insulin. And then we have dinner, maybe some buttered spaghetti or something, which are carbs, which causes the pancreas to produce insulin. And then before bed, what's the child get? Dessert which is always ice cream or cake or cookies or something like that, which are carbs, which makes the pancreas produce insulin. So this pancreas has been working hard all day. And this is not a one-off day. This is our normal. So all throughout this person's life, they're going to be overworking their pancreas. By the time the pancreas gets to be 60 years old, it says, I'm done, done. I can't do this anymore. And it gives up. You see how that can happen? This is not a problem that develops in your 60s. It's a cumulative problem from your entire lifestyle of dietary choices. So over time, you end up with 
a little bit of buildup inside your arteries from all this excess sugar. Remember the sugar crystals, right? Because if they can't enter the cells to fuel the cells and we're out of storage units, they're gonna stay in the bloodstream, just like you said. And crystals are heavy. So they're gonna settle on the inside of the arteries. And when they settle on the inside of the arteries like this, just like that cake frosting, it's gonna make the inside of the arteries stiff. So the arteries can't expand around the waves of blood that our heart produces. So that puts more pressure inside the artery. And what does that give us as a diabetic? High blood pressure. That's right. Now, if we don't pay attention and start acting on it here, and we continue our ways, our arteries start to look like this. Because the sugar isn't the only thing that's deposited. Those crystals, those sharp, jagged crystals are gonna catch everything that floats by, like cholesterol, which looks like pizza cheese inside your arteries. Gets all bound up in that crystal. Uh, cells get shredded as they go by and those cell fragments get all wrapped up. So you end up with a lot of gunk inside your arteries. Remember those arteries are now stiff. They're not expanding or contracting. So we're getting less blood flow. Well, do you think things heal well with less blood flow? No. So if we really don't pay attention to this and we get further along in our diabetes career, we end up with this. Blood that slows down or stops clots. Nothing is getting through there. What happens when we get no blood flow to an area? It dies. And this is how we end up with amputations. So you see like diabetes is a, a bad thing, right? So if our patient has diabetes, we need to be paying really close attention to signs that maybe blood flow is being affected. So we would see color changing. Come offline. We would see color changes. We might see skin changes. We might see wounds. We might see a lot of different things that would indicate there's a problem. What would we do with anything that we saw? We wanna make sure we're reporting it to the nurse, absolutely. So if we have a patient with diabetes, we wanna pay really, really, really close attention to their skin because that's our early warning sign. That's why foot care exists. Good, make sense? It also means that our patients with diabetes are not going to heal very well because we aren't getting good blood flow to those areas. The blood is um, interrupted. Does that make sense? But I just gave you a big clue a few minutes ago when we're looking at this. Right? Our cells are saying what? What are they saying? I'm starving. That triggers your brain to eat, right? Triggers a craving. And the brain is saying, okay, cells are starving. We need sugar in the cells. What's a quick source of sugar? Soda. Okay, soda. What else? Ice cream. Candy. Donuts. Cake. All the good stuff in life, right? So when your cells are saying I'm starving, the brain is going to trigger a craving for a quick dose of sugar. That sugar is gonna enter the bloodstream but it can't get into the cells. So the cell cells continue to say, I'm starving. Anybody ever know a diabetic? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Diabetics crave sweets. Why are they craving sweets? Is it because of a moral failure on their part that they, they just can't control their 
you know, wants. Why are, why, why, why are they craving sweets? Their cells are dying, not just starving, dying, dying. That's a big deal. So when you have a diabetic patient and you catch them with a bag of M&Ms underneath their pillow, do not try to punish them. Their cells are dying. This is a life and death struggle. And you come in with your little, I'm gonna chastise you for eating something you're not supposed to eat attitude does not help. Did that help that dying cell? No, they're craving for a reason. So yelling at them isn't going to help. Telling them they shouldn't eat sweets. They know they shouldn't eat sweets. They know this, but their cells are dying. This is a life and death struggle going on in their body at the moment. So what do we do? What, what can we do about it? We know they shouldn't be eating sweets, but we also know their cells are starving. We also know that it doesn't matter how many sweets they eat, it's not gonna help, but your patient doesn't realize that. So we're gonna come back to that in just a second, okay? We're gonna come back to the craving, but when you're looking at a body, remember these crystals, right? These crystals are heavy. When you're looking at the body, gravity is gonna affect, have an effect on the body. So it's gonna pull these heavy crystals down to the lowest points on the body. What is the lowest point of the upper body? What is the lowest point of the... Yeah, your feet, right? hand care, foot care. Do you see why we're doing this? You're doing this not to clean the hands and the feet. You're doing this to look for changes that indicate a problem with diabetes. You guys see that? That's why we do these two skills. It has nothing to do with getting the hands and feet clean. And a lot of people don't understand that. They just learn the cleaning part, but they don't understand this. So what does this mean to us um, when we have our diabetic patients? Well, when your patients crave that sugar, that means their cells are not being fueled properly. We know there's a problem there. So instead of telling them, oh my gosh, you shouldn't be eating that sugar, what we can do on the back side of every single cell is a little tiny back door that's opened by protein. Now, it's not as efficient. It doesn't work as well as sugar, but it does work. So if you have a patient who's craving sweets, if you notice they're eating M&Ms, try to get them to eat some protein with it. So an apple and cheese or half of a tuna sandwich or peanut butter and crackers, right? If you can combine the carbs, which will satisfy their brain, and the protein, which will open the cell, you can help metabolize so their cells aren't starving and they're less likely to have more uh, cravings triggered. So we can kind of stop that cycle. Does that make sense? Okay. This is why diabetics are often told to eat every three or four hours around the clock but we want to pair a protein with a carb when they're eating like that. So a half a sandwich every couple of hours or you know, um, peanut butter and crackers or something like that. That helps satisfy the brain and the cells at the same time, but it keeps this nice steady level in the body. Because what happens is if you dump a ton of carbs in, those break down into sugar. Now your body has to take care of all of that. So your, your sugar level rises. And then as your body tries to store it and use it, your sugar level goes, woo. Now we've got a low sugar level. So the, bless you. So the body says, oh my gosh, we must need sugar. So then we get cravings and we dump a bunch of sugar in there and our sugar level goes up and our body uses it and stores it. And then the sugar level goes, woo. So if we eat on a regular consistent basis, it keeps that blood sugar level a little more stable. But the key is to pair protein with the carbs. 
And ideally it should be at least a two to one ratio. One to one is better, but very few people can maintain that. Two to one is, um, is pretty good, okay? So let me give you an example. So let's say that you go through a drive-through, we'll pick on the golden arches down the road here, go through the drive-through and you order a medium fry. Well, that is about 40 grams of carbs. So that means that we need 20 grams of protein to go with it. 20 grams of protein is like two chicken breasts. No bun, right? So trying to, to eat enough protein to offset those carbs automatically decreases your carb intake. One-to-one -one would be ideal. Make sense? You guys understand a little bit more about diabetes now? Okay, so let me go back one real quick because there was something I didn't tell you. Okay. So we have all the blood or all the arteries in the body, and we know that uh, those crystals are going to be pulled down. So hands and feet are going to have the most effect. Um, that doesn't mean that that's the only place that can be affected. Your eyes can also be affected because they're very small blood vessels. But the other thing that's affected is nerves, because the sugar doesn't just coat the inside of the arteries; it actually coats the nerves too. Now our bodies are hardwired. We're not wireless. If I stub my toe, there is an actual physical line, a real line that connects my toe to my brain. When I stub my toe, my toe sends a signal up that line all the way to my brain and says, hey, it hurts. And then my brain can take a look at what's hurting, what, what caused it, right? We are physical line. Well, the problem with diabetes is that sugar, if we have nowhere else to store it, and we've kind of maxed out our blood vessels, we got to put it somewhere and it actually will start to coat the outside of the nerves. Now that signal that's trying to go from my toe to my brain is interrupted. The signal can't get through all of those crystals. So it stops. So now I stub my toe, I have an injury, but my brain is not aware at all, has no idea that there's an injury there. This is why when Henry stepped on the um, thumbtack, his brain didn't know it was there. Now you and I would know, I step on a thumbtack, I'm gonna be hopping around saying a few words, right? Because it hurts. But if I have diabetes and my nerves have been affected, and we call this neuropathy, um, I may not be aware that there's an injury. And that's where you come in. This is why we do foot care, to be able to look at the bottom of the foot. Now, part of this too, you guys are young. You're very bendy. I'm looking at, at all the pretzel shapes you guys have got yourselves into, right? You can look. In fact, you sitting there can look at the bottom of your foot right now, right? I do not bend like that. I can't look at the bottom of my foot. As I get older, I'm going to get even less bendy. So when I'm in my 80s, you really think I'm going to be able to pull my foot up and be able to look at it? So we need to understand that when we're working with the elderly population, they don't have the same um, inputs that you do. They don't have the same pain reflexes. They may not have the same neurological awareness. They may not have the same visualization. Their eyes may even be affected. So even if they could get their foot up, they may not be able to see it. There's a lot of reasons why they need you to look for them. Good? Okay. That's what foot care is all about. So if we know that the reason that we're there is not to wash the foot, the reason we're there is to look, do you think somewhere during the skill you might actually have to say, I'm looking at the foot? <laughs> So we need to be aware that that is an important component of this particular skill. Other than that, we're going to use the same principles that we learned for, for uh, hand and nail care. We're going to follow the care plan. We're going to do our opening. We're going to use a barrier. We're going to uh, keep track of linen rules, not hold everything up against our uniform. Washing rules are going to matter. No soap in the basin. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. Keep control of your washcloth. If you're gonna apply lotion, warm it up first, wipe off the excess, 
Um, we're going to do our closing at the end. So all of those things still apply. It's just a little lower on the bottom. But the big thing about this scale is visualization. They need you to look. Good. Questions? Questions? All right. Let me show you this one. I am not getting on the floor today. Sorry. Two weeks to go before my doctor's appointment for my knee. I cannot wait. All right, so this uh, skill can be done in about six minutes. Um, you have, yeah, someone with your level of experience should be able to do it within 13 minutes, so it doesn't take that long to do. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Wonderful. I need to put your chair. Is that okay? Yes. Let me go close the curtain, wash my hands, and then I'll gather your supplies. Okay. Okay, I'm going to put a barrier, and we'll place this on the floor. Right in front of you, and you can place your foot on the barrier. I'm going to get a basin, soap, and lotion. Place that on the barrier. I'm going to get two washcloths, and a towel, and a set of gloves. I'm going to get some water to wash. Go 
are the bottom of this row. Now I'm going to apply some lift. So we're on the legs and in our hands. Apply legs to all surfaces except the point of toe. So we're going to lift your foot. We'll apply legs to the bottom as well as the top. And now I'm going to wipe off the excess lotion so that you don't slip. So I can put the foot back on the area. And now I can reapply the foot. Don't put your shoe on. Can you start your hand right over here? Okay, once you're done, I need to put all of my supplies away now. I'm going to gather my dirty linen and place it in the dirty linen hamper. I'm going to take the basin to the tank and clean according to the basin cleaning procedure. On the way back, I'll collect the soap and the lotion and put the basin back in the hamper. Now I'll collect the barrier and throw it away. Now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, your call light is here. If you should need anything at all, please let me know. Can I get your magic email real quick? No, thank you. I'm going to open my curtains and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps in my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Okay, any questions on foot care? The skill itself is not, it doesn't take a lot to learn. It's all the rest of it that I taught you because what I was just telling you is probably gonna show up on the written test. Gloves are needed. Okay. Or not needed. It depends on the patient. Right. But here's the problem with foot care. So when you're doing hand and nail care, you can see the hands before you ever start. So you're able to see whether you need gloves, right? If there's any incision sores, wounds, that type of thing. But we're looking at the bottom of the foot specifically to see if there's those things. So we don't know if there's any wounds there. So if you might encounter um, open skin, you need gloves. So gloves really should be worn for foot care. For the test, they're considered optional. You don't have to wear them for the test, but I would. I would. Just because there is the element of unknown. We just don't know. We can't see until we're there. Okay. Good. All right, let's move on to page 106. And we're going to learn how to assist the resident using a bedpan. Care plan at the top of page 106 says the resident has requested a bedpan. The resident is not wearing undergarments and is able to wipe self. The resident is able to move as directed. So I want, um, what I'm going to talk to you about now is on page 105, toileting methods. And we're going to talk about this, what's on the screen here. So how do I put this? Bedpan is a last resort. 
How do you guys go to the bathroom? Yeah, you just get up and you go, right? You don't need any help. Nobody goes with you. You just go to the bathroom. You take care of everything your, yourself. That's what we want for our patients. We want our patients to be able to go to the bathroom and take care of their own elimination needs. We're not involved. That is called bathroom privileges, or you may see bathroom ad lib. Now, some of our patients are gonna need a little help. So that might say, our care plan might say bathroom with assist. So we would help them with whatever they need help with. Good? Those are the first two things we jump to. I don't even consider a bedpan until I've gone through a whole list of stuff to see if we can meet the elimination needs any other way. So our very first choice is you go by yourself or we'll give you a little help. But if the patient can't get all the way to the bathroom, we need to come up with another solution. And that other solution is probably gonna be a bedside commode. Looks like a toilet, acts like a toilet, bring it over beside the bed. They just transfer from bed to bedside commode and they use it, but it's still a toilet-like experience. We clean the, bed, the bedside mode, but it's still a toilet-like experience for the patient, okay? So bathroom, bathroom with assist, bedside commode, bedside commode with assist. Those are our first four options. That's what we want. That's what we're going for. But if the patient can't do that, if they can't get to the bathroom or they can't use bedside mode, now I'm left with very few options. First thing I'm going to ask myself is, is the patient even continent? I mean, can they hold their urine? If not, we're just going to clean them up every two hours using the peri care technique we'll learn next week. But if they are continent, I'm left with two options, either a catheter or a bedpan. Now we don't use catheters for convenience. There has to be a physical reason the patient needs a catheter because they usually lead to urinary tract infections. So we don't wanna set our patient up for failure. So catheters, we don't wanna use unless we have to. So that only leaves me with one option. This is the last one on the list, this is it. It wasn't my first choice. It's last on the list. And the reason it's last on the list, multiple reasons they're uncomfortable, no way around it. They're uncomfortable, but they're also, you've been trained since you were about this tall, don't pee in the bed, don't pee in the bed, don't pee in the bed, and certainly don't poop in the bed. Just because I put a plastic pan under your butt does not mean your brain is gonna let you pee in the bed. There's a psychological restriction with this particular skill. So just putting a bedpan under a patient does not mean they're automatically going to be able to go. You may have to try this three, four, five times to get any results. They're uncomfortable as well. When you're on the toilet, there's about this much space between your undercarriage and the water. You got a nice little buffer there. A bedpan, you have about this much space between your undercarriage and whatever liquid, and it's not water, is inside that bedpan. Now, when urine comes out, it comes out under pressure. So you have pressure hitting a flat, flat plastic surface, so you get splashback. Bedpans will require cleaning of the undercarriage. Does that make sense? Okay, they're not comfortable. Your patient is gonna get all kinds of wet and they know what the wet is. It's not comfortable. Does that make sense? Bedpans are a last resort. We don't wanna use them if we don't absolutely have to. But if we have to, then we will. But there's a couple of things we need to know about using a bedpan. When you put Visual for me. If I have a patient If I have a patient laying in bed 
and I put a bedpan underneath their bottom, what does it do to their bottom? Yeah. How many of you ladies can pee uphill? You certainly can't poop uphill. But if you are successful, if you're able to push out some pee, it's going to go right up your back and into your hair. So there's a problem with a bedpan here. When you put a bedpan underneath their bottom, you cannot leave the bed flat. You've got to get them into a toileting position, which is upright. If you forget this, it is a bad day for your patient. So do you think it counts on the state exam? Most important part of this skill is putting the head of the bed up so the patient can go. But now they're sitting on the bedpan, pushing it down into the bed. You can't get the bedpan out from under them if they're sitting on it. So we have to put the head of the bed back down to remove that bedpan. Now with all of the motion of the bed, up and down, whatever's in that bedpan is gonna slosh around. So what could we put on the bed that might protect it that's waterproof and absorbent? A, a chucks, a barrier, yeah. So we're gonna put a chucks under the patient, put the bedpan on top of the chucks, make sure it's positioned properly, put the head of the bed up, give them toilet paper and a call light. When they're done, put the head of the bed back down, take the whole thing out. We don't carry an open container of urine through a room. That's just gross. So we're gonna take the chucks out at the same time and wrap it over the bedpan. Take it to the bathroom, empty it into the toilet, rinse it, dry it, store it, but your patient wiped themselves. I know that because the care plan told me that the patient can wipe themselves. So if the patient wiped themselves, if the patient wiped themselves, what do they need to do after they use the bathroom? What do you do when you, yeah, wash your hands. So for this skill, you have to give them a hand wipe. Just a, like a yeah, a wet washcloth or like a, a sandy wipe or something like that. Just something to wash their hands off so that when they eat lunch, they're not eating a side of E. coli. <laughs> but there's a couple things that you can do to make this skill a little bit easier on your patient and yourself. But you have to ask the nurse for both of these. Remember, head of the bed up and down, sloshing, right? Peeing, under pressure, splashback, right? You got all those things going on. If you take toilet paper and loop it up, big loops, big loops, big loops, big loops, lots of big loops, and then you lay it in the bottom of the, of the bed pan, it'll absorb that urine, less sloshing. It'll prevent the splashback problem. It's an awesome way of handling a bed pan. But if we're measuring the urine, you can't soak it up with toilet paper. So if we're doing I's and O's or intake and output, no toilet paper in the bedpan. If we don't care how much urine is in there, put toilet paper in the bedpan, it'll help your patient, okay? The other thing that you can do, have you ever worn shorts and sat in a car on leather seats? What, does, what happens to your skin in the seat? Yeah, and that's because Plastic or leather, either one, when it gets heated up, becomes sticky and your skin sticks to it. We have a bare bottom on a plastic bed pan. You leave them there for any amount of time. When you try to take that bed pan out, it's going to stick. It's going to stick, which means you kind of have to pull on it a little bit and there's liquid inside. Not a good solution. So if you can put a little bit of powder on the outside seat part of the bedpan, it helps prevent the patient from sticking to it. But you have to ask the nurse because if our patient has a wound, we can't use powder. If they have a respiratory condition, we can't use powder. If they have an incision, we can't use powder. So we need to ask the nurse to make sure that that's appropriate. But if we can put toilet paper inside and powder on the outside, it makes using the bedpan way easier. Now there's also something else. Let me show you what a bedpan looks like. This is called a pontoon style bedpan. 
We also have a fracture bedpan, which is thinner. So if somebody cannot lift their hips up, we would use a thinner fracture bedpan that just kind of slides under the bottom, but it doesn't hold very much. This is what we call a standard bedpan or pontoon bedpan. If it looks like a toilet seat, it's where the butt goes. Imagine sitting on that. No bueno. So if it looks like a toilet seat, it's where the butt goes. So this goes underneath the bottom of the patient, right? And then we take it away. Where would you dump the contents? That's where it normally goes. Please don't put it in the sink. But once you dump this in the toilet, we're gonna rinse it and dry it just like we do everything else for the test, put it away. No big deal, it's single patient use. It's just like your toilet at home, you probably don't clean it every time you use it, you flush it, rinse it. Okay, same thing here. But in a clinical setting, we have this really neat gadget and it's on uh, the toilet. It actually sticks up, looks like a little uh, shower head. When you bend this forward, it'll start spraying into the toilet. Some of them you have to press the, the flusher thing. Some start spraying automatically, but this is actually a bedpan cleaner. When you lever it forward and it starts spraying over the toilet bowl, you can clean a bedpan very easily right there over the toilet. So you're not working over the sink, which is much more hygienic. Now, the problem is, that this is a flat plastic surface filled with human waste. When you have water under pressure hitting a flat plastic surface, you get flashback. So you want to dress for the job here. Do I want that, that body material all over my clothing? So I want to wear some sort of a disposable gown to cover my clothing. I probably want to cover the holes on my face. So a mask with a shield, eyewear. You want to try to protect all of your doorway ends from biological matter. Good? Make sense? Questions? Our patient's going to be uncovered for this skill. What do we need? Privacy blanket. Other than that, you know the skill. We follow the care plan. We do the opening. We're gonna be handling body fluids, so what do we need? Gloves, patients uncovered, so we need a, we don't wanna hold stuff against our, when we clean something, we rinse it, we dry it, we store it, and we do what at the end of every skill? Closing, you know this skill. There isn't much here that you need to learn for this particular skill. But if you look at page 106, if you look at the bottom of the page, you may be doing this on a live testing student, you may find yourself sitting on a bedpan for the test. But this is a simulation skill. So if you go back up to the care plan, this now starts to make sense. It says the resident is not wearing undergarments and is able to wipe self. So if we know this is done on a real testing student like you, and it says the patient's not wearing undergarments and able to wipe self, what that means is that we're gonna do a simulation here. You're gonna remain fully clothed. You're gonna keep all of your clothes on. In fact, we're gonna give you some more clothes to wear. We're gonna put a patient gown on over your clothing. That sentence exists so that nobody's trying to take your clothes off during the test. And nobody's trying to clean you up during the test because that sentence allows the evaluators to say that, is, that action is not on the care plan to stop the, the other student from doing that. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is a live patient skill. You may find yourself on a bedpan, but you're not really gonna pee. It, this is simulated. So when we go over to the bathroom, we're gonna dump pretend urine in the, the toilet. 
there's not going to be any real urine. Okay, good. Good. When you put the bedpan under the patient, you do want to ask them, is that comfortable? You want to make sure that it's in the right position because as you put the head of the bed up, that bedpan might shift a little bit because where the, the body bends, the bed bends. That's where we have the bedpan. So as we put the head of the bed up, that bedpan might shift a little bit. So you wanna make sure it's comfortable before you leave the patient. For the test, you're not gonna go anywhere. You have no other patients. You have nowhere to go. So for the test, you're just gonna step on the other side of the curtain and tell them to let you know when, you're, when they're done. In a clinical setting, you are not gonna wait for the patient to go. Patients don't go with an audience. You need to give them some privacy, okay? Good. I'm gonna show you that skill in a minute, but let's go to page 76 real quick. And I wanna to talk to you about the team's report. So when you go to work, doesn't matter where you go to work, pick a place, wherever you go to work, there's gonna be a shift that's there before you and there's gonna be a shift that comes on after you. You are not working 24 hours a day. So you, you're going to be getting reports from people that are leaving and you're gonna be giving reports to the next people that are coming. So this is called shift report. You're gonna tell them about your patients, what to expect, what happened, anything abnormal. It, but you have to have a very condensed, concise way to pass this information on to make sure nothing gets missed. Now, remember at the end of the shift, you wanna go home. You have been there eight to 12 hours. You want to go home. You don't want this to be a long drawn out process. You wanna be able to get through report as quick as possible. So having a consistent way to give report is helpful. This is called the TEAMS report, T-E-A-M-S. And it's everything that a CNA needs to know. Remember that CNAs are primarily responsible for ADLs. What are ADLs? Activities of daily living, things like toileting, eating, dressing, bathing, grooming, right? All of those things. Well, that's what this report is all about. Team's report is an ADL report. So the very first thing you need to know about your patients is how do they toilet? Because you know that sometime during your shift, they're gonna have to go. Everybody has to go. So the very first thing we need to know is how do they toilet? That's the T, toilet. The next thing you need to know is how do they eat? Because Everybody's gonna have to eat on every shift. So how, or at least drink. So are they on a special diet? Are they um, on thickened liquids? Are we encouraging liquids? I mean, what is their, what, what do we need to know about eating? Do they eat in a room, dining room? What do we need to know? Then we have the rest of the ADLs. We don't really spend a lot, they don't get their own category, but dressing, bathing, grooming, you know, what do we need to know about those things? Toileting and eating have their own special category because they're much more in depth than you have the rest of the ADLs. Then you have mobility. Now mobility has its own special category as well because a patient that must remain bed bound, you need to know that so you don't get them up out of bed to try to go to the bathroom. Mobility has its own special category. So when you're giving report, how do they toilet? eat, what about the rest of their ADLs, mobility, and then S is for special. So vital signs every two hours, or they have a doctor's appointment today, or whatever else was not covered under those other categories. So I can give report very quickly. I can tell you room 210 bed one is a 73 year old white male. He toilets ad lib with one assist. He eats a regular diet, feeds himself, his ADLs, he grooms and bathes himself, mobility out, out of bed to chair as he wishes, and he gets vital signs every four hours. It took me 20 seconds to give you an entire report on one patient. If I got 10 patients, I could be out of there in three or four minutes. Okay. Now, 
where you work will depend on how much information you get. If you're working at a nursing home where you know the patients, the other people know the patients, everything is just daily routine, hardly ever changes, your report might be everybody's good. Mr. McGillicuddy fell last night. He's on vital signs every four hours. That might be your whole report because everything, you already know the patients, their routine. If you're working in a rehab center where your patients are there for six weeks or so, you might get to know your patients, but you're still going to have admissions and discharges. So that report might be a little more in depth. If you're working in a hospital, your patients change hourly. So those reports are going to be much more in depth. You're going to have to get a lot more information about each patient because you're not going to know anything about any of them. Does that make sense? So where you go to work will depend on what type of uh, report system you use. Now, the other thing about this is that if you're working in a place that the patients are usually the same, this report sheet might actually be printed. You might actually get what you see at the bottom of page 76, where it's all printed out for you. If you're working in a hospital, nothing is going to be printed because the patients change way too often. Okay, good. Make sense? All right. Okay. So anybody have any questions about what we've gone over so far? I'm going to show you the video for this bedpan. We're going to learn range of motion. I'm going to show you that live, but I got to explain what range of motion is. And then we're going to take a brief five minute break so I can print out the test applications and we're going to go through those. You might possibly get a few minutes of practice at the end of class today, but maybe not. But I, I'm hoping, but I don't know. Um, starting on Monday, though, you will have practice time built into the program. Okay. All right, so let me show you this one. These are our testing tips for this particular skill. And these are, um, you can see these here. Remember, I always have these available for you guys. Yes. I do have a question. I seen on the um during the final method. Yep. Uh, for the bed pan. Uh it says two clinical trials. I'm okay. Sure you went over that the live information, but yep. uh, why would we need two clinical trials? Okay. That's a great question. And I should have you're right, I should have gone over that. So with, remember I said that we have to put a chucks on the bed because we're putting the bed up and down, right? And sloshing. We have to put a chucks under the bed. Our care plan tells us the patient is not wearing undergarments. That means we're going to be touching personal skin, right? The butt. So I probably should be wearing gloves to put the chucks under the patient and the bedpan under the patient because there's bare personal skin. Now, it's not strictly required for the test, but I would suggest it. But now those gloves have butt juice on them. Do you want to touch that bed controller to put the head of the bed up with butt juice gloves? Probably not. So let's take those gloves off, put the head of the bed up, make sure the patient has call light and toilet paper and step outside of the curtain. When we go to take the bed pan out, well, we know there's body fluid. So we need to have gloves on to take the bed pan out. That's why there's two sets of gloves. Technically, the test only requires one, that you wear gloves when you take the bed pan away. I want you to have gloves for both. 
because of the personal skin, Aunt Bud Juice, right? right. Okay. You'll never forget it. <laughs> I know I have a unique way of holding things. <laughs> but it sticks so very well. It does stick. <laughs> That's You'll see that this whole video is My name is Dottie. I'm with Panic Fit. How are you? Hi, how are you? Wonderful. I understand you need a regimen. Can I assist you with that? Sure. I'm going to place a cart for you off my hand to get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay, I'll need a truck and a pharmacy blanket for this girl. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to place this pharmacy blanket over you. This will help keep you warm and protect your privacy as you do sit still. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to spread this out without snapping it or shaking it. And I'll have you hold this in place so I can pull your sheet down. That way your sheet remains clean as you do this still. Okay, I'm going to prepare a chest to place under you. Just worry about the bed scan in place. I'm going to hold the truck where Frank was and roll it toward me so you won't work a dirty roll today. Place this on the bed. I'm going to open the drawer and put an X on the thing and get your other gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to bend your knees so that you can lift as high off the bed as you can, and I'm going to unroll the truck underneath you. Okay? Yes, sir. All right, go ahead and bend your knees and lift up. Okay, and you can relax. I'm going to go around to the other side of the bed and unroll. Okay, Mr. Jones, can you lift up again, please? Move the trucks out, making sure it's been moving properly on the bed. You can relax. Okay, now I'm going to get the bed can out with the drawer. I'm going to place this under your bottom, see if I can get you to lift. And relax. Is that comfortable? Yes. Okay, I'm going to put the head of the bed up, but let me remove my gloves first. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to put the head of the bed up. Please tell me when you're comfortable. Yes, sir. And you may have to adjust that bed can a little bit as you do. Tell me when you're comfortable. That's good. Okay, here's your toilet paper and your fall light. And I'm just going to wait out here. Please let me know when you're done. Okay, Mr. Jones, I understand your penance. Let me help you with that. I'm going to put the head of the bed down now. And please do not lift your head. Once the head of the bed is in the lower position, I'll put on a pair of gloves. And I'm going to hold that bed can flat as you lift off of it. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to take the floor of the truck and hold the bed can flat as you lift off of it. You can go ahead and lift when it comes through. One, two, three. Thank you. I'll remove both the bed can and the truck. Please take this to the bathroom for disposal. I'll be right back. Once I get over here to the bathroom, I'm going to unwrap the bed can and we'll throw the trucks away. When it can't get its contents through the bed can and through the toilet. And then I'll rinse the bed can. I'll deposit the rinse water into the toilet as well. And then we'll set the bed can down to dry. Take it up with a paper towel. I'm going to dry the inside. We'll throw that paper towel away. I'll dry the outside. Throw that paper towel away. And get one for the drawer. 
Okay, I'm going to place the dead pan in the drawer along with the toilet paper. And we'll use the paper towel to close the drawer. Now I can remove my gloves. Thank you. Okay, you can come back to the legs if you'd like. And I'm going to pull your sheet up and remove the product paper. I want to make sure that we roll the blanket in a ball so that any smelly edges don't consume any other surfaces. There you go. Here's your call light. I'm going to put this in dirty linen. I'll be right back. Okay, Mrs. Jones, are you comfortable? Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Can I ask you for that? Your call light is there. Please let me know if there's anything that you can do. I'm going to open your curtains and wash my hands. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Any questions? Any dead pen, yes. Uh, how many questions? When we get a hold of this mm -hmm. for patients to use the dead pen, when we come back, do I have to wash my hands? No, because we didn't leave the room. Okay. In a clinical setting, if you leave the bedside, you know, if you leave the room, then you need to wash your hands, okay. right? Because of patient cooties. Right? We want to wash off patient's cooties right. before we go to another patient. We're not leaving the room for the test. There's no other patients, nowhere to go, so we don't have to wash our hands. Okay. okay. But yeah, in a clinical setting, yes, you would. Because you don't want to stay in the room. <laughs> it's uncomfortable, it is. All right, any other questions? Okay, let's go to page 53. Five three. So this skill is perform passive range of motion to shoulder. Now our care plan says provide the following range of motion exercise to the resident's left shoulder, flexion extension and abduction adduction. Provide three repetitions of each exercise. The resident is not able to help with the exercises. Don't freak out over these big words. I know the first time you see them, it's like, what? <laughs> what am I doing here? Um, this is actually way easier than you think it is. But there's a couple things we have to go over first. You understand why we're doing this particular skill. Remember, the why is just as important as the how. So let's go to, let, let's talk about range of motion. So in healthcare, we tend to think of everything as something that makes the patient better, right? We're, we're always focused on getting the patients better, but that's kind of dangerous for us as CNAs because we really don't do much to make people better. We just try to help them while other people are trying to make them better. Make sense? Okay. So we have to get our focus right here. Range of motion is a series of exercises that we do to patients, but they're not designed to make them better. They're designed to help the patient from regressing or losing function. We actually have a whole department that's geared toward making people better with exercise. Anybody know what that department is? Who makes people better with exercise? Physical therapy, yeah and occupational therapy and speech therapy. Yeah, they, they are designed to improve muscle function. Now, physical therapists, that's a doctorate position. How long do doctors have to go to school? Yeah, it, yeah six to eight years actually, yeah. So you have four years medical school, then internship and residency. So, you're talking about 10 to 12 years. 
to become a physical therapist. How long are we here? Four weeks. That can't be us. We do not do exercises to make people better. Not us. Now, even physical therapy assistance, that's a two-year degree program. How long are we here? That's not us. That is not why we do exercises. So let me tell you a story about why we would do exercises. Let's talk about Frank. Frank is a man in his 70s, lives across the street in Timber Pines, not the ALF. He actually lives in a house, drives a golf cart everywhere, plays shuffleboard and bridge and tennis. And on every Tuesday, he plays tennis with his brother, Ralph, and man, are they competitive. And on this particular Tuesday, Ralph is, uh, Frank is out there playing against Ralph, and he hits the ball so hard and feels something in his right shoulder give way. Drops the racket. Off to the ER they go. The ER doc says, good news, bad news. The bad news is you tore your ro right rotator cuff. And I'm assuming you're right-handed. He says, yeah, I'm right-handed. He says, that's bad news. But the good news is that the doctor has an opening and can do a surgery on it tomorrow and get you fixed up good as new. He says, sign me up. Can't go home like this. So he has surgery on his shoulder. Two days later, discharge planner comes in. She says, you've got to go somewhere. We need this bed for other people. You are going to need some help, though. You can't drive right now. So you're going to need somebody to take you to physical therapy. You're probably going to need somebody to help you with bathing and dressing and grooming and all that kind of stuff because one of your arms is out of commission. Do you have anybody at home that can help you with, like, cooking and cleaning and bathing and dressing and all that? And he says, no, my wife passed away a few years ago. My brother still works. It's just me. She says, what about a rehab? You can stay right there. They can take care of all the stuff you need help with. And physical therapy is right down the hallway. They'll have you fixed up in six to eight weeks. Good as new. He says, sign me up. So here he is in our facility. As the nurse, I do a head-to-toe assessment. I'm looking for real problems and potential problems. And I ask you to help him with bathing and dressing. I ask you to help him with cutting his meat and opening his milk at mealtimes, whatever else he needs help with. And I ask you to help him with all of his other ADLs that he needs help with, right? So at the end of six weeks, physical therapy has done a great job on that right shoulder. It's working perfect. And he's had you guys doing everything else for him. So what has that left shoulder done in that time? Yeah, it hasn't done anything. And it, as a result, it's going to get weaker. And the shoulder joint might actually lose mobility. We call that a frozen shoulder. So when he gets discharged, good news is we fixed his right arm. Bad news is we broke his left. Did we really help him? No, he's actually leaving in the same condition he came in in. Just opposite sides. So we've got to be better about this. So when he comes into the facility, my job as the nurse is to do that head-to-toe assessment, right? I'm looking for all real problems and potential problems. So I ask you to help him with bathing and dressing and grooming. I've got you helping him with cutting his meat and opening his milk. I've got you helping him with all of his other ADLs. But I'm also aware that that left arm isn't going to do a whole lot. So I'm going to ask one of you guys to do range of motion on that individual on the left arm, just to maintain the level of ability that we currently have. Good. Make sense. So physical therapy or all the therapy services, they do exercises to regain function, make something better. CNAs do exercises to retain function, keep a current level. So we don't do pain. If the patient gets to here and says, ow, we're, the next one goes below the ow. And then we tell the nurse, hey, we got to here and got ow. And the nurse can figure out what that means and what to do about it, not our job. Our job is to notice it and let them know. We don't go to the point of pain. We go below pain. So that means you've got to be paying attention to your patient, listening. Are they saying, ow, watching their face? Are they grimacing or wincing, right? Feeling what's happening. If they start to stiffen up, you know that there's a problem. 
Make sense? So paying attention to the patient's cues is a really big part of this particular skill. You want to be watching for signs of pain. That's not us. We want to maintain what they already have. We're not trying to make it any better. Now, care plans count. Our care plan tells us which arm we're going to be working on. Make sure you pay attention to that. Because if you exercise the wrong arm, remember the other arm just had surgery. What happens if you come along and start moving an arm that just had surgery? Oh yeah, you can undo that surgery in a heartbeat. You can cause internal bleeding. You can cause a dislocation. You can cause all kinds of stuff. So, do you think it's going to be a big deal on the state exam if you exercise the wrong arm? Yeah. I've had a lot of people that came through the class that told me, yeah, I took the exam and I failed on range of motion because I did the wrong side. And I don't know why they failed me. I did it all right. They just, they, they were picky and they failed me because I just, I, I forgot and did it on the wrong side. Well, if that were a real patient, there would be consequences. So it's not that the test is being picky. It's that we wanna make sure that the patient doesn't have any ill effects from what we do. Make sense? Not being picky. All right, so there's a couple of principles here. Now we've already learned the first one, right? We always lift from below with a flat palm. We never lift from above. We also want to support at the joints. We've heard that before as well. But we want to make sure that when we're doing a range of motion, we return to the start position. So if I'm doing abduction, adduction, I'll explain what those terms mean in a minute. But abduction, adduction is to bring the arm away from the body and back down, kind of like I'm, I'm doing, making a snow angel, right? If I go all the way up and then come back to here, that's not a full range of motion, right? This, this doesn't do a whole lot. I have to go all the way back to start. There's no shortcuts here. So start all the way up and all the way back. Okay, make sure you go back to start. And then we wanna make sure we're monitoring for pain. What do we do if we find pain? Yeah, and we go below the level of pain for the next one. Okay, good. Oops. Oh, there we go. All right, so there's three different motions that CNAs can do. All of this is on page 51 and 52 of your book. 52 has, uh, in the first column, has those three motions. There's flexion extension. If I asked all of you to extend your left arm above your head, like you're asking a question, can you do that? Extend your left arm above your head. Yep, get that elbow nice and straight all the way up. Yep, bring it all the way back down in front of you. Good. So extension is a straightening of a body part and flexion is a bending of a body part. They're two halves of the same exercise. They go together. So when I ask you to extend your arm above your head, right? extend straightening of a body part, and then I had you bring your arm back down, that's the flexion part because my arm is flexed. Two exercises, but one action. They're two halves of a whole. Okay, good. The second exercise that they can ask you to do on patients is abduction, adduction. So abducting a child takes it away from its family. Don't do that, that's bad, right? Taking it away from its family. So if you abduct an extremity, you take it away from its family. Now this is more of a side to side motion. If you go up for extension and back down, that works different muscles than going out to the side and back down. Different muscles. So flexion extension is forward, up and down. Abduction, adduction is side, up and down. 
Good. The third exercise that CNAs can do is rotation. Rotation is an around motion. Not all joints can move in a rotation motion. But if I rotate my wrist, it goes around. Rotating the shoulder is a little different though. Most people think if you're gonna rotate a shoulder, it's like a pitcher wind up. That's actually not rotation. If you hold your arm out to the side, palm up, and then you roll the arm all the way forward so your palm up, upside down, and then roll all the way back, you can feel that in your shoulder. That's a rotation motion. Rotation is more of a rolling action. How do we know which body part to exercise? How, many, how do we know what exercises to do? How do we know how many repetitions? So all we gotta do is follow the recipe. That's it, that's it. So this recipe tells us to perform flexion extension and abduction adduction of the resonance left shoulder three times each. We're gonna put an opening in front. We're gonna put a closing in the back. We're gonna decide if we need gloves for this patient. And that's the whole skill. If you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this entire skill in four minutes or less. This is one of the fastest skills we have. Okay. Hmm. Not what I anticipated. All right, I need to volunteer somebody to come over here and lay down in the bed. Thank you. You can lay right on top of the sheet. Go ahead. Okay, and I am going to simulate hand washing for the sake of time for this skill. Can I get you to kind of scooch down just a little bit because my camera doesn't reach quite that far. There we go. Good, comfy? All right, so here we go. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Fantastic. I need to do some exercises on your left shoulder. Is that okay? I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. I'm going to come over here and close the curtain. I have clean hands. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm gonna do all the work. All you have to do is let me know if there's any pain or discomfort as we do this, okay? First thing I'm gonna do is bring your arm above your head and back down to the bed like you're asking a question. We're gonna do this three times. Let me know if there's any pain. Remember, we always support at the joint, so I'm gonna lift all the way up and all the way back down. Feel okay? Mm -hmm. That's one, we're gonna do two, all the way up and all the way back down. One more, all the way up and all the way back down. Feel okay? Mm -hmm. Any pain? Okay, I'm gonna bring your arm out to the side and back in like you're making a snow angel. We'll do this three times. So I'm gonna lift from below, up and all the way back down, one. Feel okay? Mm -hmm. Down. Feel okay? One more. Yep. All right. Any pain or discomfort? Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Are you comfortable? Right. Would you like a magazine before I go? Here's your call light. If you need anything at all, let me know. Press the red button. I'm going to open the curtain. Wash my hands. Think about my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Questions? Questions? Okay. All right, so we're gonna take a quick five minute break in just a moment, but I want to um, 
point this out to you guys. On our main website, foryourcna.com, under the testing menu, we have test registration instructions. So everything I'm going to go over with you, um, it will be on here. I have two presentations on that page. One is a video where I actually do a test registration right on the screen. The second one is a slide-based presentation so you can control the speed, okay? But they're detailed with screenshots and everything. It's almost impossible to mess up test registration if you're following these instructions, okay? Um, remember that you guys all have access to this the test prep online course as well. Um, did you guys get your invitation? Did anybody accept the invitation and enroll? Okay. okay. Remember that I've got a lot of additional activities in here that we aren't going through in class, and it'll be really, really helpful for you. One of the things that we have in there are sequencing activities for all of the skills. So you see all of the steps and you have to put them in the right order. You also have a supply gathering activity where you have to see all the supplies and you have to click on the ones that you need for this particular skill. It's a great way to learn the steps and the supplies for each skill. You also have all of my videos on there as well. Um, all right, so, uh, and I told you that I ordered the new flashcards as well. So they'll be in in about a week or so, and those will be very helpful for you as well moving forward, getting ready to test. Let's go ahead and take a five minute break. Let me print off your um, test applications and then we'll go through that. when you're ready to register. Um, so we're all going to register independently. So when you fill out the registration, you can either register in person or online. I'm gonna go over this in just a minute, but you can register in, or not in person, I'm sorry, uh, by paper or online. When you register, that's when you'll have to pay. Okay. Don't need money today. Yeah, no, I don't, um, I don't collect the money it's paid directly to the customer. You do, yep. And I'll give you that information as well. 
Oh, no, no, no. They're all very valid, very valid um, questions.
So this is the registration packet. The sheet on top is the instructional sheet. There are seven pages to the packet. We're gonna go over them together in class, but remember you have detailed, detailed test registration instructions right here on our website. Test registration instructions. Okay, let's talk about this page. These are the four steps to registering for the state exam. Step one is a background check. If you work in healthcare, healthcare, if you work in healthcare and you had a background check with a photo and fingerprints, then you may already have one in the system. They aren't allowed to access background checks from any other industry. So if you had a background check for a concealed carry permit, that doesn't count. If you had one for childcare, that doesn't count. If you had one for the school system, that doesn't count. It has to be healthcare. If you already have one, you can skip step one. If you're unsure, get a background check. If you need, you know you need one, these are the steps to follow. So there's a couple of different places that you can get background checks. Um, not all of them are created equal. <laughs> the one that we recommend right now is, this is a national provider. It's done at UPS, certain UPS stores. But what we need is a live scan provider. This is um, the one that most of our students use, it's Deontis. I gave you the um, website there. There's another one in Wesley Chapel for Identigo. And then below it, you'll actually see a website that you can go to to find other background check providers. So you don't have to go through this one. You can go through others, but um, all things being equal, this is the one that, that our students seem to have the best opportunity with. Now you have to pre-register. So you have to go online and set up an appointment and pay before you ever go to the background check appointment. So you need to go to that website and register. You can't pay there, but they usually have same day appointments available. Okay. Um, when you register for the background check, you're gonna need a code, a, um, a, a routing number. That's this, this is the ORI number. You need this code. It's very important because if you don't use that code and we are going to choose CNA exam as what, we're, what we need the uh, background check for, CNA exam, um, you need that code for it to be routed to the right place, okay? And I have a web page here on background checks. So if you want more information, along with links, you can go to that page at the bottom of that column. Now, once you've done the background check, wait about 24 hours, and then you can apply for the test. When you go, real quick, when you go for the background check, they're gonna take your fingerprints and a photo and a signature. They are not gonna give you anything. They do not give you a report. They don't give you a card to send in, nothing like that. It's all electronic because they know if they hand you something, you can go home and Photoshop it. <laughs> so there's a chain of custody here. So they don't give you anything. You go to the appointment, you go home. You wait 24 hours, you apply for the test. So step two is to submit your application. Now, what I gave you is a paper application. You can actually fill this out and mail it in, but that's the slow way. That's gonna add about a week or two to your processing time. That is the slow way. The online application is exactly what I gave you, but it's on a web page. So if we do this together, you can use this as a template to apply online. Okay. 
So to, uh, I have a video on this. You can actually see the video there at the top. You can also see it on the web page um, at the bottom of that column. But you're going to go, if you want to apply online, you're going to go to prometric.com slash nurseaid slash FL. And the important thing to remember here is to select challenger under certification option. We'll get there in just a minute. About uh, one to three days, roughly, after you submit your application, you're going to get an email from Prometric with an attachment. Open the attachment. That's where your specific information is located. When you get that attachment, it looks like this. This is what your attachment looks like. You want to look at two different things. The first thing you want to look at is where it says application status. You need to make sure it says complete. That means that they received your application, there wasn't anything missing, and they got your payment. Complete. If it says incomplete, you got to figure out why. There should be more information. Now, below that, down here near the bottom, it'll say FBI background status. That means they went and looked for your background check. If they didn't find it, it's going to say record not found. That means that something happened and your background check did not get forwarded to the right filing cabinet or you didn't go get one. Your application stops at that point. Stops. They cannot process your application without the background check. That's why you always want to do that first. Okay, your application stops. When Prometric gets your application and your background check, when they get those two things, they put them together and they send them to the Board of Nursing. Somebody at the Board of Nursing has to look at your application and your background check, and it's an eyes on process. This is not automated. They need to make sure that you aren't going to put grandma in jeopardy. So they take this very, very seriously, and they're going to evaluate your background for any offenses that might possibly put grandma in jeopardy. Now, they know everybody was young and dumb. Everybody was young and dumb. Not everybody got caught. But everybody was young and made poor decisions. They're not going to hold that against you. Okay? So one criminal charge when you were young, you did everything you were supposed to do. They're not going to hold that against you. They are going to look at it. They're going to look at it, but it's not going to really hold it against you. So if you had a shoplifting charge when you were 17, you did everything you were supposed to do, community service, fines, whatever, and you've been good since then, they're okay with that. If you've had 14 shoplifting offenses and the last one was three weeks ago, that shows a pattern and that does not keep grandma safe, right? You'd be surprised at how many cases we have had where people, well, we just had one last week. Did you hear about this one down in Fort Lauderdale? Oh my gosh. CNA stole a, pa stole a patient's personal identification, opened up a credit card in her patient's name and went and got plastic surgery done. No joke, just happened, made the news. Yeah. So these are the things the Board of Nursing is taking seriously, right? <laughs> you want plastic surgery, do it on your own dime, not your patients. Unbelievable. But it happens. We just had one here uh, a couple of years ago in our community, a CNA stole $30,000 from a patient, a home care patient. Yeah. stole 10,000 and then went back and the patient realized what was happening. They set up a sting operation and 
basically caught her with 20 grand. Yeah. So these are the things that the Board of Nursing is looking at. Are you an ethical person? Are we putting grandma in jeopardy by allowing you to work unsupervised in the home? That's what they're looking at. So violent offenses, they're going to look at pretty close. A history of theft, they're going to look at pretty close, right? But they understand hiccups. They understand extenuating circumstances. Um, once the Board of Nursing looks at your criminal background and your application and says, oh, this is a good person. This is good to go. Valentina, you're ready to go. They put it send it back to Prometric, approved to test. So your, your status would then change to approved. And Prometric will assign you a test date. That'll come in about two to three days via email. You don't get to pick your test date. You don't get to pick. They assign you. Now, they work seven days a week. So you might have a Sunday appointment. They, work set, they only take off major holidays, Memorial Day, 4th of July, Labor Day, Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year. That's it. So yeah, they'll be testing on Mother's Day, guys. They will. So you probably won't because it's like this weekend. <laughs> but um, they, they don't take off non-major holidays. So once you're approved to test and they assign you a test date, they're going to email that to you. If that date doesn't work for you, if you say, oh my gosh, I can absolutely not make this date, you need to call up Prometric right away and say that date doesn't work. And while they're on the phone with you, they'll find one that does. But your first date is always assigned. Then they'll work with you. Make sense? Do not wait until two days before the test to tell them I can't make that appointment. You need to do it right away. Otherwise, they're going to, excuse me, they're going to charge you because they don't have enough time to put somebody else in that slot. Okay. So the, the, the way the timeline works is you get your background check done. 24 hours later, submit your application. One to three days, you're going to get a response. Um, after about seven to 10 days, you're going to get your test date. So if you register this weekend, if you go home and register this weekend, you should be testing about a week or two after graduation. So that's why I do this on the end of the second week. The timing works out very well. Now, I will tell you that right now, this is what we call busy season for CNA testing because all the colleges and high schools and vocational training centers graduate in the spring. So that puts a whole lot of CNAs in that need testing right now. So there is a little bit more of a delay in the spring. So keep that in mind. It might be two or three weeks after graduation. So you don't want to put this off too terribly long. You want to get registered as quickly as you can. Good? Questions? Do you understand the process? All right, let's go through the application really quickly. There's seven pages. We're not going to fill it all out together. Most of this you can do on your own, but we are going to go through some of it. So on page one, the first page, you're going to see a stop sign. That says, hey, make sure your name that you put on the application is your actual name on the IDs that you have, because we have to prove who you are to test. So be aware. Don't use nicknames. Don't um, shorten things. Put your name as it appears on your ID. You need two forms of ID to test, one with a photo, like a driver's license, passport, military ID, non-expired. The other ID has to have a signature, like a debit or credit card, or a library card, or a social security card. Those two names have to match. Those two names have to match. Below that, it asks if you need ADA accommodations. So it's Americans with Disability Act. That's, you know, do you need a sign language interpreter or seeing eye dog or something like that? Um, if so, you need to check the box there and um, fill out their form. 
So go here. So below that is your candidate information. You're gonna fill this out on your own. You're, you're gonna put your name, turn the page. The top of the, the page there is the rest of your information, you know, your address, your phone number, your email, all of that. Moving down, um, criminal and Medicaid, Medicare fraud questions. I need your attention. If you have a felony in your background, you need to see me after class. If you have no felonies in your background, follow my instructions exactly. For number one, check no, but leave A, B, C, D, and E blank. So the second part of the second page, the bottom of the second page, for number one, check no leave all of the sub questions blank. Go to number two and check no. I'll help you after class. Leave the sub questions blank. Do not, because if you check anything on those sub questions, it triggers the system. Very important, leave the sub questions blank. For number four, number four and number, I'm sorry, did I do, uh, I'm sorry, number three, let's go to number three. Three, four, and five have to do with Medicare or Medicaid billing as a provider. Has anyone ever had a medical license in Florida or any other, were you a doctor, a nurse, a doctor? If you have never been a medical provider, the answer is gonna be no for three, four, and five. No for three, four, and five. I know that this, this section is very confusing for people, has nothing to do with Medicaid as a consumer. It has to do with Medicaid as a provider. They wanna know, did you defraud the federal government? If you did, we probably don't want you working in healthcare, right? Three, four, and five is no. Disciplinary history. Again, they're asking, were you ever a CNA or anything else in medic medicine? Knocked around some old people, got your license taken away, and now you're trying to get it back. That's what they're asking here. If you've never had a medical certification in Florida or any other state, you have no disciplinary history. So the answer will be no for all of those. Criminal history, self-explanatory. You have one or you don't, yes or no. If the answer is maybe, it's probably yes. <coughs> the second question under criminal history, this is record sealed or expunged. The last question is a juvie record, juvie record. They will find it. They will find it. You know, lawyers make a fortune off of telling people, hey, we'll make it all disappear. It'll be like it never happened. No, no, we find it. There's always a trail. All right, now number page number four, page four, I cannot help you with. You need to read those questions and answer them on, their, on your own. I cannot help you with those. Turn the page, you can go back to that later. Page five, I've already filled out most of this for you. At the top of page five, under certification training option, E3 was checked off. If you register online, do not choose anything other than E3. Let me say that again. Do not choose anything other than E3. And our instruction sheet here tells us to select E3. Some of you are gonna go home, get awfully confused and try to select E1. And that will stop your test. You want to choose E3, you're all challengers. Training information was blacked out because we only need to uh, fill that in if we selected E1 or E2, what do we choose? E3, test site information, you're going to test at a regional test site, regional test site. So now you've got to choose which regional test site do you want to, to test at. Our closest one is in um, 
Our closest one is in Tampa. So if you look here at the bottom of this sheet, remember our information sheet? The bottom of the information sheet, I've got three of them listed for you. I have Tampa by the airport. I have Tampa by Bush Gardens and Ocala for my Northern people. You're gonna choose one of those. If you don't like any of those, this is the testing center list. These are all the testing centers in Florida. This is it for the state of Florida. This is it. So we have to choose one testing center. If you're going to mail your application in, you need to put the code here. If you're going to do your application online, there's a drop down menu. You're just going to choose one of those. Good. And then you have exam selection and testing fees. This gets confusing. The first one is the plain test, plain Jane test. Some of you may want the computer to read the test question to you. That would be the second option with audio. If you want to test in Spanish, there's an option for that, for the written test. Clinical skills is always in English. So you can either have the plain test, regular, or choose the first option, or you can ask for audio to have the computer read the test question to you. That's the second option. If you want the written test in Spanish, that's the sixth option. If you want it in Spanish with audio, that's the seventh option. That's the only other language that's supported for the test. The written test is either English or Spanish. English or Spanish. No other language. So the test fee is 155. And that's the amount that you're going to pay when you register. If you're going to use this paper and mail it in, the very last page is where you're going to put your payment information. If you're going to register online, you'll input your credit card information in the online portal. Right, right. You're going to select one option out of that list. Now, if for some reason you have to retest, let's say you failed the written, then you would select just that fourth option or third option where it says written in English. If you have to reach a, a retest for the skills, you would select the fourth one. Okay. You only have to, if you're retesting, you only have to uh, complete the section that you failed. The other one stands for two years. Um, yeah, the, this is the registration the test regist to register for the test. This, this isn't the, this is registration, right? You can, you send it in when you're ready. You, you don't give it to me, not, not here now. Home. Okay. Okay, the last, or page six, um, there's an affidavit at the top. You have to check a box that says you have read and received and read. This, these are the papers it's referring to. These three papers right here. It's right up here. You can always grab it and read it. It's also online. So you can access them online. But this is their privacy policy. It tells you how they're going to use your information. Make sure you check that box. And then you're going to sign and date at the bottom. Sign and date at the bottom.
At the bottom of the page, it says if you do not receive your authorization to test, that's what ATT means, within 10 to 14 days, contact Prometra. Um, notice they don't give you a phone number. Yay. Plus. So right down here at the bottom of the third column is the phone number for Prometric. So 10 to 14 days is the amount of time that it should be processed. Now that's if there's no hiccups. You know, if your payment goes through, if your application is complete, if you have no criminal background, that's no hiccups. But if you register online, there's one more box that's going to show up that's not on here. And this confuses a lot of students. At the very end of the online registration, there's a box that says, or that asks you how you're going to supply supporting documentation. What this means is if you have a criminal background and they need more information from you, they need a letter with your side of the story or they need your court records or whatever. If they need more information, they're asking you, how are you gonna send that to us? Are you gonna fax it in or are you gonna mail it in? So just pick one. Doesn't matter which one you pick, just pick one, okay? So if they need supporting documentation, you either have to fax it in or mail it in. Just tell them how you plan on doing that. That's not on the paper application, but it will be on the online application if you do the online. Okay. On our website, remember here, right? Test registration instruction. This is the very first thing you see on that page is a video of me on my screen doing the online application. Everything from going to the website, what link to click to get to the application, how to register for an account, how to start. It's not as, it. there's no button that says, hey, start an application. So it's a little bit more complex. So I actually walk you through from the very beginning, going to Google, typing it in the search bar, going to the website, what to click, what to put where, everything is covered in that uh, video. And then the slide-based presentation is that video, but just in a way that you can control the progression. Okay? Thank you. I strongly recommend that you apply this weekend. That's if you select E1 or E2. Yeah, what are we selecting? E3, make sure, because otherwise it is gonna ask you for a school code and we don't show up because we're not, yeah, we're not a 120 hour program. Now this is interesting. Remember I said they just passed a whole bunch of new laws for CNA? Well, one of the ones that should go into effect probably next year is that if you went through one of those 120 hour programs, you don't have to take the skills test. Yep. So that'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. All right, so that's the application. Anybody have any questions on the application? Anything I can help you with? Remember, we have detailed instructions on the website. Follow along. Any other questions? All right, so I, um, tomorrow I'm doing a live at three o'clock uh, for all of my YouTube people. Feel free to join us uh, tomorrow. Next, this coming Tuesday is the game show. So tune in for that. And um, we'll be back in class on Monday at nine. So any questions before you guys go? You should have some practice time built in on uh, Monday. All right. Have a fantastic weekend. Try to do something fun. Okay, let's see what questions we've got here. Oh, Cynthia, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not real sure. I All I saw was the 
So this is for Cynthia. She asked if there was uh, clinicals with 120 hour class. I don't know. All I saw was a legislative update. So I don't have any guidance yet on how they're going to administer that, that new statute. But I did see that it, it did pass. So I don't know how they still have to go through rulemaking and all of that. So I don't know how they're going to administer it. But it's interesting that, you know, the, the clinical skills, they're, they're uh, doing a workaround. So we'll see how that all shakes out. All right. So no other questions on YouTube that I see. So until next time, happy caregiving. Bye.